I'm going to turn to English. Sorry for the little words in Spanish for those of you who don't um, understand. Uh, as you know, and as I told you earlier this week, uh, we are today at the uh, Centro Cultural de los Ejércitos. It was originally the military casino, uh, so it's a very special building, as you can see from, from the even the walls, the windows, so I hope you, you will appreciate the location we have chosen for this event. Uh, today we have one... So today we have one of the most interesting sessions of this event that uh, Yate Spain is celebrating from June uh, 14th to 17th. Uh, it is uh, the expert panels uh, that we have uh, chosen to do um, here. Uh, first speaker of the afternoon will be uh, Carmen Romero. She is uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy and she was appointed in year 2016. Uh, she joined NATO in May uh, uh, 204 as deputy spokesperson and head of press and media, a position she held for 12 years. And she has also been acting NATO spokesperson, including during the Russia-Georgia conflict in August 2008. Uh, prior to this, Carmen had a long career as the foreign affairs correspondent for FN News Agency based at the United Nation Nations in Geneva, Moscow, and Paris, covering events such as the revolution in Romania, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the war in Chechnya, to cite some. Uh, from 2001 to 2004, she was the defense and foreign affairs correspondent for um, FA News Agency to the European Union and NATO. And during that period, she was also special envoy to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Carmen has a master's degree in journalism and information science from the Universidad Complutense de Ciencias de la Información in Madrid. And in, 2000, uh, sorry, in 1996, uh, she received an award for young journalists by the International Press Association in Madrid for her coverage of the war in Chechnya. So, Mrs. Romero, the floor is yours. Buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon uh, from NATO headquarters in Brussels. And many thanks for that extensive uh, introduction. So first of all, from my side, what I would like to do is to, um, is to say thank you, to say thank you to Coaje Yata for all the work that you are doing to explain NATO to young people in Spain, and not only people from Spain, but people who are in Spain. And this is even more important uh, with the summit taking place in, uh, in, in Madrid. Uh, as we all know, the Madrid summit is taking place at the decisive moment for our security. And it was already going to be an important summit before Russia invaded Ukraine. But in the new security context that this has created, the Madrid summit will be even more significant. And this is what I would like to share with you because the Russian aggression has really shattered peace in Europe, and it has also shaken, and this is very important, the rules-based international order. The, uh, the invasion uh, of Ukraine by, by Russia is creating uh, global instability, and it's also creating, we all see it, a serious energy and a food crisis. And I want to stress this, it is really Russia who has created the food crisis by attacking Ukraine, destroying key infrastructure, and also blockading uh, ports in, in the Black Sea. So despite what Russia propaganda says, international sanctions against Russia have nothing to do with this. That's a point that uh, I really want to, to highlight. Well, how, what has NATO done and how has NATO reacted uh, to this crisis? Uh, I would like to share with you the fact that since the beginning of this crisis, NATO has responded with speed and with unity to do two things to protect all allies because this is our priority and to support Ukraine, Ukraine uphold its right to self-defense. And this is a right that is contemplated, that is enshrined in the United Nations Charter. Against this backdrop, the leaders of the 30 member states of the Alliance will take important decisions at the summit in Madrid, and they will be taking decisions to keep NATO strong and ready in a more dangerous environment. So one of the strengths of NATO is to adapt, is to adapt to a change in security space. And every time the world has changed, NATO has changed with it. 
And this is uh, what we have been doing also since 2014, since we, um, we experienced the illegal accusation of Crimea by Russia. Since 2014, NATO has been going through a very, very profound adaptation. And we have strengthened, especially our collective security, our deterrence and defense policy. A few examples of this is that we established four multinational battalions in the three Baltic states and also in Poland. And we have increased our presence in the skies and in the Black Sea since 2014. And this is also why when Russia launched its brutal aggression, aggression against Ukraine in February, NATO was really prepared to respond. And in response to this new security reality, a few, a few things I would like to share with you about our, our response. We have reinforced our ability to protect and to defend every inch of NATO's territory. We were able very fast to deploy additional forces in the eastern flank to avoid, and this is also key, to avoid that the war would expand into allied territory. Now we have over 40,000 troops under direct NATO command, and these troops are supported by air and naval assets. We have also doubled in a question of a weeks um, since the conflict started, the number of the vital groups that we have uh, in the Eastern part of the Alliance to eight. So we had four, now we have eight. And this increased presence takes us from the Baltic to the Black Sea. And this, this is the immediate response. But now at the Madrid summit, we will go even further and we will significantly strengthen our deterrence posture for the long term. So we will be looking at a longer term and make sure that NATO is prepared to deal with any challenge from any direction. So not only coming from, it may come from the East, but from any possible direction. So I would like you uh, to remember one thing. The objective of this reinforced deterrence, of this reinforced military presence is to preserve peace and prevent conflict. So with our deterrence, what we are doing is to send a strong signal of unity to Russia and also to any other potential adversary to be very careful, not to even think about attacking a member state or entering NATO territory. And this is the key of our deterrence to avoid the conflict and to maintain peace for the 1 billion people, 1 billion citizens living in our NATO countries. So everything that the Alliance is doing is defensive. It's not provocatory, it's defensive because we are a defensive political, political and military organization. So now Ukraine, what is it that we are going to do to, to continue to support Ukraine at the summit or on the road to the summit. As you know, NATO allies have provided military equipment, financial and humanitarian support. And we expect that at the summit this month, allies will agree to do even more, especially with the provision of non-lethal uh, and also lethal assistance in supporting Ukraine in its reconstruction for the long term. I, I can also tell you that we are really determined to do all we can to support Ukraine. And since allies understand the stakes of this war, which stretch far beyond uh, Ukraine and Europe. And as we speak in a few, in a few hours, we will have the defense ministers of NATO um, meeting together with the defense minister of Ukraine to discuss what more we can do. Uh, as you know, NATO as such, cannot provide military assistance uh, to Ukraine. We cannot provide weapons, but we can provide military assistance. We can provide non-lethal support that can support the armed forces um, and the defense mechanism of Ukraine. Then uh, also looking at the summit, resilience. Resilience is going to be a priority, a strengthening NATO's resilience. And our member states are determined to increase their national, but also our collective resilience, including on energy security, because with this crisis, we see how important energy security. So the aim is to make our societies stronger, to make our people and our institutions uh, able to resist and to bounce back from attacks. 
our infrastructure must be more resilient and also our supply chains have to be more diverse and more secure. And as our NATO Secretary General says, Jens Stoltenberg, civilian resilience is our first line of defense. So that's going to be a top priority at the summit. Then another important topic is um, keeping our technological edge. So NATO is innovating a lot in terms of technologies and on the road to the summit, we have established something that we call a defense innovation accelerator. We have also established a 1 billion euro innovation fund to support small companies, startups, uh, to develop innovative solutions to security challenges. So, uh, and this fund will also allow us to invest on young companies working on the dual use of emerging and disruptive technologies. So uh, this is also uh, one of the important topics that will be dealt with at the summit. And climate change, I know you are all young people very interested in climate change. So this has become a top priority for our alliance. This is really something very close to the heart of our Secretary General, who used to be the UN envoy, uh, United Nations envoy on climate change. So we are now working to incorporate the security impact of climate change into everything we do, from defense planning, which is very important, to a capability development and also into exercises. At the summit, the, um, the plan is to agree a new mapping methodology for in order to measure military greenhouse gas emissions and also to agree a target to help NATO contribute to the goal of net zero emissions. So this is very, very, very high on our political agenda and of course has also military, military connotations because the idea here is to adapt our, our military capabilities to deal with the security consequences of climate change while keeping our military forces uh, effective. So it's a, it's a very, it's a very important balance uh, to strike and we are investing a lot on that. Partnerships are also key to NATO. And we see that in an era of strategic competitions and when we see also authoritarian regimes contesting core principles for our security, we have to work even more closely with what we call like-minded nations and organizations. So we are putting more emphasis in working with with others. And here, our partnership with the European Union, I can assure you that has reached unprecedented levels. Finland and Sweden have taken a historic decision to join NATO. They have not joined NATO yet, as you know, but they have already presented the request to join NATO. And this is a, a demonstration of the importance of the open door policy. The, the doors of NATO continue to be open. At the summit in Madrid, we will also be taking important steps to support what we call our vulnerable partners, countries like Georgia, like Moldova, like, uh, like also Ukraine, uh, to help them build their capabilities and also strengthen the resilience because they are faced with interferences and, and maligned um, uh, influence. So, so that's something that we want to do. Bosnia, for example, is also one of the nations that we will be uh, supporting more in dealing with, uh, uh, with external interference and, and to build stronger um, uh, resilience capabilities. And then we have uh, our Asia Pacific partners. I'm talking about Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea. And these countries will be taking part for the first time in the NATO summit. Why? Because they are like-minded countries and they also play a very important role in helping us understand the, the challenge of China, for example. Then, uh, as I was saying earlier, the Madrid summit will be of particular importance, not only because of the complex new security situation that we are that we are in and because of the decisions that we expect in that regard, but also because our leaders will approve a new strategic concept. So what is uh, the NATO strategic concept and what does this mean? The strategic concept is the most, is the occupies the second place uh, in terms of important documents in NATO after the Washington Treaty, 
which as you know, is the basis, is the founding uh, act, you know, that creates uh, the North Atlantic organization. So the new strategic concept is going to define the security challenges that we are facing now. And we'll also highlight the political and the military tasks that NATO will have to carry out to address these new security challenges. They also, the new strategic concept will drive uh, what we call our continuous transformation over the coming years. It will, um, it will give us the tools to be effective and to deal with all security challenges. So as, um, um, one of the things that, that we are doing is compare the current strategic concept, which was approved in 2010 with, uh, with the, the new one that we are now negotiating, that our member states are negotiating and that they will approve by consensus in Madrid. Everything in NATO is decided by consensus. So if one nation uh, doesn't agree uh, to one political decision, there are no decisions taken in NATO. That's also important to keep in mind. And we see that now in the case of Finland and Sweden, as you know, uh, Turkey has um, a series of concerns. And now we are looking into how we can bring uh, those concerns into uh, into to help us reach a, a, an agreement so that NATO can uh, initiate and start accession talks, talks to uh, with Finland and with Sweden. So the differences between the new one and what we have right now. So the first one is the Euro Atlantic area is not at peace anymore. And in the 2010 strategic concept, uh, we saw a security environment that was defined as being at peace but that's not the case anymore. So that's already a huge change. Second, Russia. In the current strategic concept, the one from 2010, allies considered Russia as a strategic partner. Unfortunately, uh, this is not possible anymore. Our relation with Russia is at the lowest level since the end of the Cold War. And Russia's actions in Ukraine are beyond, um, are and beyond Ukraine are a direct threat to our security. So the new strategic concept will emphasize that NATO does not seek confrontation with Russia and NATO does impose a threat to Russia, but the Russian Federation can no longer be considered a partner. And the Alliance is very likely to say that we, we remain open to dialogue with Russia, especially to manage and to mitigate risks to prevent escalation and to increase transparency. And that um, NATO will maintain the long-term goal of building a sustainable relationship with Russia to ensure stability, predictability in the Euro-Atlantic area. But this will all depend on Moscow changing its aggressive, uh, its aggressive behavior. So it is really in Russia's court. Then the third point in difference will be China because the 2010 a strategic concept does not mention China at all, if China did not matter for our security. Uh, and what I can tell you is that NATO will not consider China an adversary, not at all, but the rise of China has consequences for our security. And NATO is starting to look into these consequences. To give you an example, China has the second largest defense budget in the world. Um, China has the biggest Navy uh, and China is investing heavily in new modern nuclear missiles, uh, long range missiles, hypersonic missiles in China doesn't abide by any mechanism of risk reduction and arms control, unlike um, the members of NATO who are in support of of um, a non-proliferation arms control, but China doesn't follow any arms control mechanism. The fourth point that is going to be different is the new challenges, the new security challenges. Uh, now, um, the new strategic concept is going to reflect the fact that we are facing more hybrid threats, that the threats are not conventional anymore. They are also, we also have conventional threats, but we have more and more um, hybrid threats like cyber attacks, and they are becoming more frequent, more sophisticated. Also, we have the, the threat of uh, terrorism, which is the most uh, serious asymmetric threat for the citizens in NATO countries. 
So NATO is adapting to address these unconventional challenges and that's, that's also quite relevant. So now to conclude, I, want, um, I just want to stress that uh, the three principles that will remain in the new strategic concept in the new political strategy of NATO. First, our efforts to maintain peace as we have done in the past 73 years. Second, the transatlantic bond. And third, the defense of our values and our way of life. So this to say that NATO's number one priority will continue to be to work to keep our people safe. And for this reason, it will continue to adapt to face the challenges of the future with a reinforced deterrence. Then second, the transatlantic link between Europe and North America has guaranteed our security and freedom for more than 70 years. And today, as we face the most serious security crisis since the end of the Cold War, we see that this bond is being reinforced, that what we are doing together, Europe and North America, is, is really key. And finally, the new strategic concept will make it very clear that our values define whom we are, they must continue to guide us in a more complex world where these values are clearly under severe pressure. So to conclude, the Alliance will make very clear that it is precisely in defense of our democracies, in defense of our way of life, that we must invest more in security since we can no longer take it for granted. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mrs. Romero, for such an important and interesting insight in what NATO is currently doing um, and how it is responding to, to current threats. Uh, it's been a very interesting speech, uh, so we, we really want to thank you for your participation in this event. Um, if anybody in the room has any questions to uh, Carmen Romero, uh, we would be very happy to uh, give you a microphone so you can actually speak up. Uh, yeah, there's a question in here. So, do we have a microphone? Yeah. Yeah, so here, first row. Yeah, I will repeat the question myself uh, in a very, very short uh, summary. So, uh, there are some countries that have been historically uh, showing some kind of neutrality, right, towards NATO and towards the security situation in Europe. So, is that neutrality vanishing as, as we can see that some of those uh, partners are actually uh, trying to join NATO at the moment? Thank you very much for that uh, interesting question. It's true that we see, uh, we see a pattern. We see what Denmark has decided in referendum. This is not in relation to NATO, but in relation to the defense policy of the, of the uh, European Union. And now we see the big shift with Finland and, and Sweden, which is really unprecedented because as we all know, uh, these two countries have a, a very long history of neutrality. And what uh, these two countries, for example, have seen in my, in my view, is the fact that uh, to be protected by, um, by an alliance and to have the umbrella of, of, of that protection is very important at a time when we cannot take our security for granted anymore. Because who would have thought, even if we were seen with our intelligence that uh, what President Putin was planning with the military built up um, along the borders of Ukraine and Belarus, uh, until the last minute, we, we, I mean, we couldn't believe that that was going to happen to see a land war, uh, a land war, sorry, of, of the scale um, that we hadn't seen since the Second World War happening in Europe uh, was uh, not realistic. So, so I think this is why we see three countries in Europe um, uh, is not giving up their neutrality but reconsidering their neutrality. And this is the case of, of um, um, Denmark with you know, the opt out in the defense policy of the European Union. And now uh, this shift in the public opinion in Sweden and Finland, if, it's, if there is something that has really impressed me in the many years that I have been working um, in NATO is how the public, is the power of the public opinion is, is how how fast 
uh, the public opinion in, in Finland and Sweden have, have changed their minds and see the protection of, of, of NATO in the security umbrella that NATO provides as, as a priority because um, they really see the risk of, of, of a possible conflict uh, in their countries. So, so yes, we see, we have three clear examples and if, if this will have a bigger impact, we don't know. But it also says a lot about what President Putin is trying to achieve, which goes beyond Ukraine, which is about um, trying to restore uh, the old spheres of influence in Europe. So, uh, and we, and this is why also we are going to uh, increase our support to countries vulnerable, as as I was saying to to um, to the influence in what Russia may do, like Moldova, Georgia, Bosnia. Uh, because we don't know. We don't know what uh, President Putin has in his mind. And we have to be ready. Thank you very much uh, for, the, for the answer. I think there was another question. Yep. Yeah, so I'm going to try to replicate the question for you, Carmen, so you can actually... Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, just come here. Perfect. Right, Carmen, can you hear me now? Can you hear me better? Yeah, better? great. Yeah. I can great. hear you very well now. Okay, great. I'm, I'm not sure whether she can see me. Uh, Unfortunately, I, I cannot see you. Now, now. Right. Hello. Right. <laughs> right. Well, my name is Pedro, and uh, I'm a lecturer at the University um, of Comillas here in Madrid, um, and I'm a specialist in uh, Russian foreign policy. So my question goes in line with what many academics have actually have claimed that um, Ukraine should have a, a kind of like a neutral status given that uh, there was a Treaty of Budapest after the denuclearization of Ukraine in which uh, US and Russia actually committed to, to defend Ukraine for, from any like threat, right? So many academics actually claim that this sort of neutrality has been broken uh, by NATO in terms of the uh, enhanced partnership for example, that was signed in, in June 2021, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, also the fact that the uh, offer of uh, Vladimir Putin in which uh, he claimed or he wanted some kind of confirmation that there would not be an integration of Ukraine into NATO, it was actually rejected by NATO, right? So um, they claim, in, and I, I feel myself as part of it, that there has been some sort of like provocation, that this has been a provocation from the West uh, in the sense of breaking this neutrality pact that was signed in uh, 1994 in Budapest. So if you can make any reflections about that, I'll be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro, for, for sharing your views. And uh, uh, first, what I can assure you, Pedro, is that NATO has not violated any international agreement. Uh, we are, you know, an alliance of 30 democracies and something that we cannot afford to do and we will never do is to violate any, any international obligations because we are strong defenders of the international rules order. And if you refer to the Budapest Memorandum, in that memorandum, uh, there was a clear reference to respect the right of any uh, country to, uh, to decide its own uh, affiliation, security affiliation. So basically, uh, NATO has not gone to Ukraine to ask Ukraine to, uh, to become a member of NATO. So, so this is really a, a very bad misunderstanding of history because um, everything that we have first, we have worked very, very closely with Russia for many years to build the international good space order that we have seen in place since that we have built together since the end of the, um, of the Cold War. And, and one key principle is the, um, is the right of any nation to, uh, to decide its, its security arrangements, its security affiliation. So, so first, mm, the 30 members of NATO have not violated any international agreement. And, um, um, and uh, what it, it's Russia that has violated the many, the many agreements that it signed and, and, the, and the security architecture that's built together with many other countries as part of the OECE um, uh, framework. So, so therefore, there is, there is nothing that we have violated. The contrary, we have never gone to any nation uh, that was created out of the, um, of the end of the Soviet Union 
asking them to, uh, to apply to NATO membership. That has been the sovereign decision of those countries. Uh, uh, so they have applied, they have met the standards. So, so Pedro, I, I really cannot understand, but of course I fully respect, uh, you know, the, the look that you, are, that you are making to history, because if you go to the Budapest and the many memorandums that have been approved uh, in the context, in the framework of the OECE, it is always a respect for, you know, the sovereign uh, decision of, of, of the countries and the member states to, uh, to, to decide their own destiny. And this is something that uh, Russia doesn't want uh, to see Ukraine doing. Maybe you have a follow-up question. Yeah, thanks a lot for that answer as well. Uh, there's another quick question among the public, so if you can just come over. Uh, good afternoon, Mrs. Romero. My name is Santiago Jose del Castillo. I'm graduating history from the University of Valladolid. I'm, I'm currently studying a master in military history in the University of Santiago de Compostela. Uh, my question runs in a very different field, uh, seizing the opportunity that there are seamen in the room right now. Uh, you have mentioned, allow me to read, that uh, regarding the deployment of NATO in the current situation, uh, we have four international battalions with 4,000 troops currently, and there's also like different air policy missions, such as the one that was in Bulgaria last February, the one that is in Lithuania, in Lithuania currently. I wanted to ask you, like, uh, has NATO taken any step from the naval point of view regarding specifically the Black Sea. As we know, like, it's a very strategic scenario right now. It's basically like the, one of the main commun communication routes of Russia and how is it supporting the invasion of Ukraine. So if you could make any notes to that issue, I would gladly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Santiago. So uh, first of all, uh, what I said is that uh, as a follow-up, as, as, as a result of the uh, of Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, NATO did put in place and establish four uh, battalions in, in Poland and in the Baltic states. And then since February, we have uh, duplicated, we have basically doubled the number of battalions. And now we have established four more. So now we have eight battalions. And uh, it's true that um, the naval support and the air support of NATO, it's part of that reinforcement of our deterrence. So we are, we are also increasing our presence in the Black Sea, but the Black Sea is a very contested sea, as you know. So we are doing that in a very careful way. So for example, we, uh, the US carrier Truman uh, has been for, for a long period in the, in the Black Sea, both um, as a US um, carrier, but also under NATO command, which is something completely unprecedented. The US have never, has never put under NATO command um, uh, such a carrier. So it shows that we are also reinforcing our presence in the Black Sea, but we have to do this in a very careful way. And, um, but to increase our presence there is, is, is important. And, and we will continue to look at that. And, um, and for example, now, uh, one of the issues that we see with the, uh, with the, um, with the security in the Black Sea, but also the export of grain uh, from the Black Sea, um, that are that have a border with the Black Sea, like Turkey, are doing a, are, are having also an important role in negotiating with with Russia the possibility of exporting and using the Black Sea uh, as a vehicle to uh, to to export grain. So so the role of the Black Black Sea, as you say, is has become even more more strategic and geostrategic as it used to be, and and our presence military presence will continue to be. Um, uh, reinforce to understand what is what is happening in the Black Sea to make sure that we have you know that is that is not so contested, but we will have to do this first abide abide by our international obligations and this takes me back to the question from Pedro uh, that we have not provoked Russia and this is why we say that what Russia has done has been unprovoked because NATO has done nothing to provoke Russia. We have always been very very transparent in our um, policy of open door. We have always shared with Russia uh, the fact that uh, a certain number of nations were applying to membership. And, and we have been very, very, very transparent with Russia in that regard. And including in the founding act between NATO and Russia, 
Um, we also speak about uh, the open door policy of, of NATO. So this is something that actually uh, Russia had endorsed uh, uh, in the NATO Russia Founding Act, which continues to be, at least for us, um, uh, an obligation. So, so Santiago, we will continue to, um, to, uh, to invest in the security of the Black Sea. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for uh, Mrs. Romero's presentation. It's been such a great introduction, uh, highlighting uh, especially the role of defense of the alliance uh, and, and how NATO has been evolving to, to encompass all these threats that we are currently witnessing. So thank you very much, Carmen, for, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and next time, hopefully, we will meet in Madrid. Thank you very much. I hope so. And if you want, I can take one more question. Okay. So I think a very, very quick one because we're actually very, very out of time. So yeah, a very quick one, please. Okay. I want to uh, use this stage and I want to ask you a question. Uh, first of all, I'm Zura Tarashuli. I'm from Georgia. I'm from Georgia, yeah. And I want to uh, ask you a question. Uh, uh, what do you think about uh, the perspective of Georgia and Ukraine? Uh, when will it become uh, possible that uh, these uh, countries, Georgia and Ukraine, will become the North Atlantic Treaty Organization's members? Is it clear? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your question. Well, first of all, we cannot put Georgia and, and Ukraine in the same basket. Even if in 2008, we promised the two nations that one day they will become member of, members of NATO. We did that because that was a request from, from Georgia and Ukraine, and we made that request without giving a timeline. So in the case of Georgia, we have been working very, very closely with Georgia to help Georgia meet the requirements to become a member of NATO. And Georgia has made a lot of progress in terms of reforms and, and Georgia continues to do so. Uh, I don't have the dates because this is, um, it's uh, usually a long process. Uh, it takes time. Uh, well, in the case of Finland and, and, and Sweden, if, if we have green lights uh, from all allies to start the section talks, uh, it will take, a shorter period of time because, because Sweden and Finland have been basically uh, participating in everything that NATO does for many, many years. They are basically, even if they, they are neutral or they were neutral, they have been working with us inside the organization, participating in all the exercises and everything we do. So it will be faster for them. In the case of Georgia, uh, unfortunately, I cannot give you a date, but I can give you a perspective to say that uh, Georgia continues to make progress, and there is more Georgia in NATO and more NATO in Georgia, uh, and we will continue to work very, very closely to help, to continue to help Georgia to get closer to NATO membership. In the, came, in the case of Ukraine, uh, now the, the current situation is a, is a different, um, is a different uh, perspective in the sense that Ukraine will have to decide what it wants to do when uh, it comes out of this conflict. Uh, uh, Ukraine uh, applied to NATO membership in the past, but uh, it will depend on what Ukraine decides. For example, um, in the case of, of the European Union, Ukraine has applied, as you know, to the European Union, and it may be given the status of a candidate. Um, that's what uh, the, you know, the country has requested. In the case of NATO, we will have to see what Ukraine decides. So this is the sovereign decision of Ukraine. This is why going back to Pedro, uh, NATO is not fishing for new members. Our, the countries are the ones who come to us and they ask for membership. And then we work with them on meeting the requirements. So on Ukraine, it will have to be seen. But with Georgia, uh, I can tell you that we will continue to work very hard together. Georgia is going to be represented. The Prime Minister of Georgia will be invited to attend the NATO summit in June in Madrid. 
Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Carmen. It's been a pleasure to, to listen to your answers to these questions. As I said, unfortunately, we're running out of time and we have kind of a tight schedule, so we really want to thank you. And I personally want to thank you in the name of, of the Youth Atlantic Treaty Association of Spain for having you here today. Many thanks from my side and thank you for your great questions. Yep. So for those of you who have more questions that would like to, to be uh, followed up by, by Carmen Romero, just please write them down and we will make everything uh, that's in our hands to, to just send them to, to her. Uh, so thanks a lot, Carmen, uh, and see you next time. Uh, next up in our uh, expert list, so it's been a great introduction by Carmen Romero. We will now um, ask to come to the floor to uh, Navy Captain Mr. Ricardo José Valdez Fernández, as well as Mr. Félix Arteaga and Miguel Pecoyeste, please. Is Navy Captain Ricardo José Valdez Fernández. Uh, he is assigned to the Security and Defense Coordination and Studies Division of the General Secretariat for Defense Policy of the Ministry of Defense as a geopolitical analyst. Uh, he's been on board coverage, minesweepers, frigates, and even the Juan Sebastián Elcano, which is the school boat that we have in Spain. And he has had the opportunity to command the fast patrol boat Espalmador. His life at sea has allowed him to visit ports belonging to more than 40 countries. And as a seafarer, he avoids talking about his destinations on dry dock. In the academic field, he has been a senior lecturer in operations for the general staff course, and now he's also an associate lecturer. An associate lecturer. He has tutored different master theses at the Complutense and Nebrija universities in Madrid, as well as being a military lecturer at correction tribunals. He has been stationed at the United States Navy Fleet Forces Center of Excellence in Norfolk as a maritime security expert and geopolitical analyst for the Gulf of Guinea and Asia Pacific areas. He has taught operational planning courses for international officers at the Navy War College in Rhode Island. Uh, so with, without further ado, and if I can project his presentation. Thank you. Many thanks to the organization for the privilege of being here. Next, please. Yeah. My ideas are on the screen, and that is what I want to tell you on my short lecture. We are also negotiating the summit, final political declaration related to the program is already close, already close today. The strategic concept is one of the eight areas, well, eight plus one, if we take into account the resources of the so-called NATO 2030 package. In November last year, the framing paper of the strategic concept was circulated, and today we are negotiating review number four, which incidentally is in line with Spanish interests. There are issues that we cannot hide they are divisive among our allies, Russia, China, European Union, NATO relations and resources. But we are moving closer, not without difficulty, to the final text. The following, please. Spain has a clear position on a 360 degrees security approach. This means two things for us. Firstly, the threat is omnidirectional and multifaceted, which means that cyber, ultra-terrestrial, or space, asymmetric and hybrid threats must be taken into account. Secondly, that in addition to the east, the alliance southern flank must also be taken into account. When it comes to deterrence and defense measures, this must be adaptable to changing circumstances flexible to react in any strategic direction and sustainable with adequate resources. NATO represents a commitment to defend each other against any threat. We agree with the rest of allies. There is no doubt that 2014 marked a turning point in Russia-NATO relations with the illegal and illegitimate invasion of Crimea. On the slide, we have the creation in 2019 of a new command in Norfolk to generate maritime expertise in the Atlantic and to pay attention to reinforce the European theater. The Kola Peninsula is home to the main Russian naval assets 
of the Northern Fleet, but has been a multiplier for the rest of the fleets. The strategic importance of the Duke, Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom passage is growing for the Americans, especially from being understood only in the, Atlantic, in the transatlantic context to becoming the gateway to the Arctic Ocean. In addition, the A2AD strategy in Kaliningrado and the Kola Peninsula left no doubt about the threat to Europe. The Suwalki Corridor was another of our concerns. In the new strategic concept, we are seeing that at some point, we will have to get back on the path of cooperation with Russia. I don't know the extent, but a cooperation with Russia is a must, not the actual one, just the future. And we have to bear in mind that we have to uh, progress in relation in the following 10 years. We want the forward present on the Easter flag to be permanent, and we will see what the size of this for is. But of course, we need to make it clear that no one is going to achieve any objective by crossing the borders and challenging the territorial integrity of an ally, as well as neutralizing external threats before they manifest themselves in our own territory. The next, please. For us, the relevance of the South is central to our security. Conflict, fragility, and instability, aggravated by climate change, generate persistent insta instability that requires a great, greater cooperation security effort in the region. The Mediterranean Sea is vital to the Euro-Atlantic security chessboard. The Mediterranean Sea is one of our priori priorities of Spanish defense policy. Its stability and prosperity affect us. We do not merely maintain neighborhood relationship with the countries on its southern shore, but rather a relationship of interdependence. The so-called NATO Mediterranean Dialogue was launched in 1994, promoted by Spain. The Gulf of Guinea has a direct implication for our well-being, not least because it is the origin of an important maritime transport route for energy resources. Next, please. Let me introduce something that is important to us. The link between the instrumentalization of migration and NATO's mechanism for dealing with hybrid threats, irregular migration, transnational and humanitarian challenges, and affects everything to our security. Remember what happened with Belarus which provoked a serious crisis at the end of 2021 with a hybrid action based on the manipulation of such flows. Well, this is what we'll probably have in the Sahel if we let Russia take the European Union rightful place for the military and civilian work we have been doing in the area. Next, please. Terrorism is an asymmetric and the most direct threat to our citizens. What makes Grey Zone Wars interesting is that they fall below NATO's Article 5 threshold and below the level of violence necessary to trigger the, US, the U United Nations Security Council resolution. Consequently, Grey Zone Wars appear to take place within the space or gap that precede traditional military campaigns. Nor are they worse per se, but are the result of strategies designed to exploit the West's legalistic view of the war and its inherent limitations. In short, coercion deterrence is a useful approach of great zone warfare. While resilience remains a national responsibility, allies have developed benchmark requirements during the 2016 Warsaw Summit, which allies can use to assess their resilience levels. The requirements related to vital public services such energy supply, transport and telecommunication networks, healthcare, critical infrastructure, and water and food resources all of which are necessary components to support military operations. As our tools and interactions become even more 
digitize the nexus between the cyberspace and emergency and disruptive technologies will only expand. In other words, new ways of disruption to our societies, security and defense are likely to accelerate changes in our strategic environment, affecting each of NATO main areas. Next, please. The Council formally approved the strategic compass an ambitious plan of action of a stronger European Union security and defense policy by 2030. NATO and EU certainly have shared values. The EU is a unique and essential partner. It has a complementary and beneficial role for the alliance. From our, from our point of view, the NATO-EU relationships needs to be strengthened in political consultations, combating climate change, resilience, development of emergency, emerging and disrupting technologies, military mobility, space, cyber, and in tools against hybrid strategies. Alongside deterrence and defense, NATO relies on negotiation, dialogue, and consultation. The military uniform may provoke suspicion among the population in the international mission in which we are deployed. Spain is unique in deployments. Our soldiers and sailors have an empathy with the local population that is difficult to see in other countries. The population need to be convinced by the facts that there is no hidden agenda in the action of Spanish soldiers. The ability of Spanish military men or women to identify within the civilian population in areas of international operations is an essential factor. Look at Afghanistan. We learned a lot of there. Unfortunately, it could have ended differently, but that was the reality. We need more civil military coordination in planning and operations more engagement with local partners, greater civilian crisis management capacity, greater commitment to supporting food and environment crisis. Next, please. In the strategic concept, there are a number of cross-cutting themes that have been taken into account without being a priority. In addition to the resilience, technological advance promotion of, go of, go of good governance and climate change, there are a human security and women, peace and security. Spain is, com is a committed ally to these last two agendas with shared common areas of action, but at the same time have their own entity. The strategic concept will give visibility to both agendas. In the case of human security, a document is being negotiated human security approach and guiding principles. This document, along with others from other agenda, will probably be released during the summit. In the area of human security, there are five areas of work, protection of civilians, sexual violence in conflict, children and armed conflict, traffic, uh, trafficking in human beings, protection of cultural heritage. The Women, Peace and Security agenda is more cross-cutting and aims to act in all areas of the Alliance work. The presence of women in military uniform deploying, deploying disadvantaged societies sends a message of a hope to the women of the country. The message is that the democracy is good as well as the Western values. Next, please. Climate change is a threat multiplier and will influence decision about where and how our armed force should operate, in what environment condition, as well the frequency and type of deployments. The effects of climate change shape our geopolitical environment and can affect the behavior of a state. For example, thawing permafrost, desertification, and the opening of new routes, maritime routes that can contribute to increase instability, and geostrategic competition. Rising temperature, rising 
sea levels. More frequent extreme weather events will lead to drought, soil erosion, and degradation of the marine environment. They can lead to famine, flooding, loss of land and livelihoods, and have a disproportionate impact on women and girls, as well as poor, vulnerable, and mar marginalized population. This could put political and economical stability at risk. Climate change can fuel conflict, displacement, and migration. While NATO is not the first response to all the challenges related to climate change, the Alliance has recognized that in order to fulfill the task of safeguarding the security of its nearly one billion of citizens, it must take into account the security impact of climate change. Next, please. Resources, refer, from our point of view, refer to well, submit, and be realistic. Core tax, prioritize some versus uh, complement. Russia, differentiating between present and future. China, equal to opportunities and challenges. A and D, arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation. NATO is a forum for consultation. Principle and purpose from two sections to one, cohesion and union. Nuclear language, discussion are taking place to avoid apologetic language. Support for vulnerable partners, Ukraine partnerships, open doors for European democracy. Conditionality. Stratcom, a strong message to our societies, especially young people. Crisis management, prevention and lesson learned from Afghanistan. A structure, be political and mindful of length. Pandemic, reference should be made. Wars do transform the world. Pandemic only accelerate trends and changes. We will see how that plays out. Next, please. It is 40 years since Spain joined NATO. For our country, being part of alliance as well as guarantee of security has been a great boost to military cooperation and has had a very positive influence on our democratic transition. We return to the European and Atlantic political sphere. It is more than a tool for the defense of a freer and more humane world. We have shared values. It is a good decision-making mechanism and the cohesion of its member stands out. It is a success story for both. Spain has benefited from the security provided by NATO. It has boosted the modernization of our armed forces and it has given a, a prominent international status. For its part, NATO has benefited from Spain's geographical and strategic location, its military and conceptual commitment. Next, please. In order to conclude, the new European security from our point of view will pass through this triangle with three vertices. The European Union is peace and stability. NATO is the collective defense. From the United States, highlight the strong ties and values that unite the two countries. Recognize the American sacrifice in defense of freedom in Europe during the two world wars and during the dark years of the Gold War, ensuring that the flame of freedom, democracy, and human rights was never extinguished in Europe. The United Nations for legitimacy and legality. The OSCE, where we participate in the structured dialogue, born in 2016, a Hamburg de declaration, as an initiative to promote security and stability in Europe and revitalize cooperation on conventional arms control and the promotion of confidence and security building measures. Finally, to underline the importance of the NATO summit in Madrid as a meeting point to reaffirm our commitment to uphold the principles that unite us and to reinforce the spirit of solidarity that is at the heart, the heart of NATO, but also to build bridges to other partners and to other regions outside the alliance. 25 years ago, the previous summit in Madrid was a trigger for NATO enlargement after the end of the Cold War. This spirit must be recaptured in these difficult times to extend our community of values and pursuit of global stability. Thank you very much.
for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Captain, for this very interesting presentation. Um, we will now uh, move on to, to Felix Arteaga, who is a senior researcher in security and defense at a very prestigious institution here in Spain, which is the uh, Elcano Royal Institute. Uh, he's also professor of international security at Instituto General Gutierrez Mellado. And, and he holds a PhD in political science and international relations, specifically from Universidad Complutense of Madrid. Uh, he's graduate in law from Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia and officer of the higher scale of the armed forces, now retired, and graduate in international security management from the National Defense University of Washington. So, Mr. Arteaga, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much for attending uh, this uh, event and those in la online with us as well. Uh, thank you very much, the organizers, uh, on behalf of the El Cano Royal Institute. As we have uh, little time and you know a lot about the strategic concept, I will try to offer in a few minutes my critical but not alternative view on the subject. I think that uh, young people should be more critical with the uh, papers, official declarations, and so forth, but they need somebody to open the fire, to, to open the uh, criticism in order to uh, gather new ideas about what is going on. So, uh, when I read uh, the guidelines of the strategic concept, my feeling is that uh, the key issue for me for on the coming concept is not about Russia, Ukraine, armed forces, and so forth. It's about the uh, future your political competition. The strategic concept will admit the, 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 the existence of this competence in the same way that the strategic compacts of the European Union acknowledged it a few months ago. We are facing a geopolitical com uh, competition, a strategic competition with uh, China, uh, Russia, and many other non-liberal countries. And this is not the kind of competition we used to have in the past. This is an unrestricted competition with no norms, with no institutions. Uh, everything uh, able to be used as a weapon will be Europeanized. And, uh, we have to be prepared for that competition. Uh, the competition is not only military, it's mainly uh, technological, economical, industrial, cultural, and many other ways, it's, and it's not only against Russia. Uh, this uh, is something that we have to present or to make aware on our populations that their future, their future, their prosperity will be affected by this new scenario of competition. Uh, of course, the implications for NATO are limited to the uh, military realm. Uh, the, the impact of this competition on security and defense, and also probably uh, the impact of the transfer of military technology uh, with regard to this new uh, order. In the, you probably don't know, ignore, but in the, in the, during the Cold War, there was a coordination committee, the so-called COCOM, uh, and, the, and its role was quite similar to the new European Union, United States, 
Technology and Trade Council to take care of the technology we are transferring to these new competitors. So that is something that we are going to uh, uh, know through the, we are, through the strategic compact. The, I, my view is that the strategic concept will help our population to become socialized, to become aware of the new uh, competition we are facing. And that is why it will reinforce the transatlantic relation. And uh, because today uh, the European Union, European partners and North American partners are not only like-minded countries, but they are uh, under the same existential threat, uh, existential competition. And that is why we need to be more united than never, and not only that, but also to uh, include on board new partners in this uh, uh, new block uh, before the global system became split into two or three different blocks. And as we are witnessing in the, with regard to the uh, Ukraine, the, the perception of the war in Ukraine, uh, we have uh, the Chinese-Russian wall, the Western wall, but a third wall made of most of the uh, countries in the world uh, whose opinion on the uh, perception is not the same, neither on the European, the, the, the Western, nor the Eastern views. And that we have to recruit new partners, not only in the traditional North Atlantic area, but uh, also in the Asia Pacific, in Africa, in Latin America, and we need for them to compete together. Of course, it will take uh, time. Uh, the geopolitical competition requires some kind of uh, geopolitical approach, uh, and this is not very common uh, public good within the European Union. We are comfort living people. We don't want to become involved in uh, long-term uh, discussions of problems with Russia or Ch China or with others. We are not uh, prepared to compete, but as far as the impact of the competition uh, impact our prosperity, our capability to export, our uh, incomes, uh, we will be more closer to, to compete. So uh, that would be, for me, the, the main uh, uh, issue uh, under the strategic concept. Second, about deterrent and defense, uh, the NATO has failed in, in the, uh, the, deter the NATO deterrent has failed in 2014. Uh, we couldn't uh, prevent, uh, dissuade the Russians to invade Ukraine, and we couldn't uh, deter Russia of uh, carrying out a hybrid warfare against uh, the Western, against NATO, against any European country, our elections, our values. In the last uh, eight years, we have failed. We have failed as well to deter Russia to carry out a conventional invasion of Ukraine. And that is uh, something that the Strategic Council will recognize. We must improve our at least of our military, cyber, and uh, hybrid capability to deter Russia and those who, who follow uh, the Russian pattern of behavior against uh, the Western country. And that is something uh, we have to improve. Uh, the good news from the Ukrainian war is that the Russian armed forces cannot be overestimated uh, as we did in the past. 
uh, NATO is more capable, uh, more able, and more advanced on conducting military operation uh, than Russia. That is uh, a fact now, not before. And that's why we don't have to uh, accumulate great quantities of military equipment on the borders, not even troops. We have to be uh, decided to defend every inch of our territory, as Carmen said before, but we don't need to come back to the Cold War period where you could see the line of uh, separation, the Iron Curtain, full of military uniforms, military equipment, and that could be even counterproductive for the European NATO deterrence. So we need uh, to invest. Uh, I'm sure we are going to invest more, but not sure we, if we are going to invest better. Uh, I see, I appreciate some kind of uh, euphoria uh, on military budget, both uh, in the military side and also in the industry. Everything is going to be paid with fresh money now. But uh, as far as we are asking for fresh money to cope with the Russian threat, we should be aware that we, at some moment we should have to justify that we have invested our new money in uh, the new Russian uh, threats and not uh, as we have been doing in the past spending the money to pay for legacy equipment out of uh, date and, lega and uh, equipment uh, which is not producing NATO any kind of comparative advantage. Uh, this is the doubt and I hope that national parliaments uh, take care, be aware of this temptation. Uh, how do we spend the money, and what for? For a long time, Spain has been uh, uh, blamed for not spending uh, the, the famous 2% in defense, and it is not a question of uh, spending uh, 2%, but spending it as an output, which is the output of the Spanish investment. It's higher than most of the uh, NATO member states. And the 2% of the full amount of uh, Spanish uh, money is a lot. But the 2% of almost nothing for many uh, Baltic countries, for instance, is nothing. So this is something that we should have to take in, uh, into account. We have invested in power projection capabilities. We have invested in, uh, the money to, uh, to accomplish our military requirements and despite, and that uh, to, to close this point, and despite the current uh, commitment, uh, the social, political commitment to spell more because we have a Russian threat calling in the, uh, in the doors, in the gate, uh, let's think in a midterm scenario in which uh, the war in Ukraine became uh, protected and that we have to uh, take care of the different uh, threats that uh, we, because of the war, we are paying a high inflation, uh, the, the economic recovery is uh, low, and, and I think that we will have a turn, the, the public and uh, political opinion turn around the current uh, perspective. And at the end, if uh, one of these uh, factors doesn't change, they will claim their money back because uh, the economic scenario is not going for the, the best, but for the worst. So, very quickly, 
core factions, territorial defense is back. Uh, it was back somehow in 2014, but now it's going to be back. We need to invest in the territorial defense, not only in territorial defense for the uh, Cold War, but for the future war, uh, better. We need more innovation, more technology, spend more on technology than on, on the cell equipment, but it's going to work well. Crisis management uh, is gone. Uh, it, was go it was to be gone uh, in the last strategic concept in Lisbon because most of the critical uh, uh, experts uh, said that the, Europe, the NATO was not prepared to carry out, not military mission, but uh, as our colleague said, uh, to, uh, to carry out military intervention to keep time uh, the civilian actors to improve the uh, prosperity, the development, the governance of the country. The NATO is not prepared for crisis management, only for military aspect of crisis management. For a long time, NATO has, trying to, has been trying to develop a civil uh, uh, capability, but uh, now I direct uh, compliment with the resources of the European Union. NATO is not prepared for that mission. Uh, it's prepared for military aspects of security sector reform, but not for the rest of non-military aspects. And, uh, of course, about the uh, cooperative security, as Carmen has mentioned, Ukraine, Georgia, and some others. So, uh, the less relevant element for me is uh, 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 elements of the strategic concept will be first, resilience. Uh, resilience, uh, I appreciate that the, the future NATO concept asks member states to increase their resilience. It is necessary. Uh, to remind them that, that, that this is a national responsibility, but this is a civilian responsibility, not a military one. And for NATO, for my understanding, it's very difficult to, uh, for NATO to commit civilian partners in the decision making, in the coordination, because every aspect of the uh, resilient, but the military one, is linked to a non-military actor, interior, uh, agriculture, uh, justice, intelligence, and, and many others. So um, it's good to talk about resilience, but uh, we should be careful. We shouldn't expect NATO to command or to coordinate the uh, resilience of national members. So. Uh, to be in addition to this, and uh, as, as, as I was uh, listening to my colleague, uh, I have seen in many NATO summits the temptation or the attempt of uh, many NATO countries to introduce new kind of threats, no? terrorism, uh, uh, migration, and they have tried because uh, it was the, the, the question of uh, the moment. But in my opinion, uh, NATO is just prepared for military uh, function, not for non-military functions, uh, because there are many other multilateral and sub-regional and regional organizations more prepared for dealing with uh, terrorism, hybrid threats, and, uh, of course, climate change. Uh, let us be serious about climate change. Uh, I don't see any role uh, in NATO for, for climate change, but to ask the armed forces to, to improve their sustainability of the equipment and so forth. But is NATO going to uh, uh, increase the, sen the sensibility and the and the awareness of the, opinion, the public opinions on the issue, uh, I don't see any role. But uh, at any time, the, I was going to say the military organization, but NATO has also a very important 
a political organization, they are trying always to, not only to increase their function, but to increase their le legitimacy, you know? We are doing something you need at this moment. What do you need? So uh, let us, I don't know what we will uh, think uh, in the different groupings uh, and for dealing with climate change and this new alternative. So, uh, summing up to close. Uh, I welcome this uh, new strategic concept. Uh, I'm sorry for the situation in Ukraine because it's going to increase the military profile of the strategic concept when it was designed at the beginning and we had some idea about what was going on. It was going to be a more a long-term uh, document than short-term now. Uh, we have to do something about the uh, Russian, but it's going, uh, the, the NATO cannot be distracted by, by the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine because the, the main threat in the long term is not Russian, but China. Um, finally, I hope that the strategic component will help all of us who have been trying to uh, maintain alive the NATO uh, uh, view or the NATO opinions and uh, the NATO need in our common places, universities, think tanks, uh, media, of course, could have an opportunity to reinforce our messages, to lose our complex of inferiority, our bias. We, had, uh, we are in the right side we have to defend our interest and we have to defend our NATO because it's, if NATO shouldn't exist, we should have to invent it uh, in Madrid, if probably. Thank you very much. So. So thank you very much, Mr. Arteaga, for such an interesting view, a uh, very critical one as you, as you advised us before uh, your intervention. Uh, we have one more speaker in this first panel on the new strategic concept of NATO, who is uh, Miguel Pecoyeste. He occupies a position as policy advisor at the Policy Planning Unit Office of the NATO Secretary General since September 2020. He is responsible for researching and drafting policy papers to provide up-to-date analysis as well as policy recommendations for the Secretary General on issues of interest to NATO's strategic outlook and policy agenda. He is also a colonel of the Spanish Army, graduate of Staff College, and over the last years he has served in several positions in the Spanish Ministry of Defense and European Union and NATO bodies. Finally, uh, Miguel Peco Yeste holds a doctorate in international security, and his record of publications includes dozens of papers in professional sci scientific journals. Uh, from 50, uh, 2015 to 2018, he was an adjunct professor in geopolitics and strategy at the Complutense University of Madrid. Miguel, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Patricia, for this kind of presentation. And uh, also thank you very much, uh, Coaje Spain, Jet Spain for organizing this act. <clears throat> I think it's very, very important to reach out young people, to convince young people that uh, we are in troubles and we have the solutions and we have the tools to afford these troubles. It's important to organize this kind of acts because it's the way to reach out this kind of people that needs to be convinced. Sometimes when we organize uh, acts addressed to very special people, they don't need to be convinced. They are already convinced, but uh, there are a lot of people that need to be convinced. So thank you very much for organizing this act. <laughs> well, <clears throat> let's go with the strategic concept. And um, I think that Carmen mentioned that before, that uh, next to the North Atlantic Treaty, the strategic concept is NATO's most important document. No? <clears throat> And uh, the current strategic concept, which was agreed in 2010, actually has served NATO well. There are elements like the transatlantic bond between the United States, Canada, and Europe, or our values. We are talking about democracy, individual liberty, 
rule of law, international order, all those things are still relevant. No? And what happens is that the world has deeply changed in the past decade. No? You know that uh, at the time uh, we used to, to say that, uh, I'm quoting, the, Euro the Euro Atlantic area is at peace. And we have now is uh, totally different. Uh, President Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine has broken that peace. But also the current uh, concept doesn't mention China. And it happens that China's growing influence is reshaping the world, which has direct consequences for our security and democracies. And finally, there is other challenges. There are other challenges like cyber, hybrid threats, or even the security consequences of the climate change that are hardly mentioned in the 2010 <clears throat> concept. And in this regard, the next strategic concept is an opportunity to set out how NATO is going to deal with this new reality. Before entering into substance, I would like to refer to the next NATO strategic concept in the context of the alliance political priorities. <clears throat> and <clears throat> there is an important starting point when it comes to speak about NATO's uh, political priorities, which is the, the meeting that the heads of state and government in December uh, 2019 in London, precisely 70 years after the signing of the Washington Treaty. And their allied leaders uh, agreed, the Secretary General, to lead a process of reflection to further strengthen the political dimension of NATO, meaning all those aspects other than the strictly military. And after consulting with allies, civil society, private sector companies, and group of uh, independent experts, the Secretary General submitted his recommendations to the summit in Brussels last year in a document that uh, <clears throat> was approved by the allies, officially became what we call the NATO 2030 Agenda. Mm -hmm. The NATO 2030 Agenda is an ambitious, very ambitious document in which um, allied leaders agreed uh, many points. And um, if uh, you want to know what is going to be reflected in this strategic concept, you need to go to the NATO 2030 Agenda. Because probably you will, be, you will find there most of the clues. You know? I'm going to highlight some more some points. Yeah? from the agenda, first of all, agree, uh, leaders agreed to strengthen NATO's uh, political role as the unique and indispensable platform for transatlantic consultations on security and defense. <clears throat> also, they agreed to reinforce deterrence and defense posture. And the war in Ukraine is clearly influencing decision in this regard, of course. <clears throat> They also agreed to strengthen our resilience, to preserve our technological aids, and even to implement an action plan of climate change and security. And the most important item in the agenda is precisely to develop a new strategic concept. But the same way that happened with the agenda, in Brussels last year, during the summit, allies invited the Secretary General to lead the process to develop a new strategic concept in time for the next summit here in Madrid. So the first draft of the strategic concept was submitted to the Council uh, some uh, weeks ago. And I have to say that the, the process to get it has been very, very inclusive. You know? For instance, there has been <clears throat> an intense uh, period of consultations and deliberations in the Council about um, uh, a number of uh, specific issues. <coughs> uh, allied and partners capitals have been celebrating a number of seminars on different topics of interest. Uh, there has also been dedicated meetings uh, of policy planning, security and defense policy directors, etc. And, of course, engagement with the NATO military authorities, partner countries, and international organizations. Well, the draft strategic concept is still under negotiations in the Council. And allies will decide 
the final outcome. No? But I would like to outline some key areas of focus, no? which are strategic competition, deterrence and defense, preparing for a more unstable world, and partnerships. So first, our next strategic concept must prepare us for a more competitive world. What means that, uh, that the authoritarian powers, you know, are trying to push back against the rules of the international order. We have seen the brutal actions of uh, Russia. We must take into account the realities of uh, China's rise. China is not our, our, our adversary. We need to be clear eh, on this. Uh, we see opportunities to engage on issues such as arms control and climate change, but uh, it's not our adversary. But at the same time, we also we have to pay attention on how the rise of China impacts our security. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can talk about the, 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 the rapid, uh, the vast increase in the military uh, uh, spending. Uh, we talk about uh, the, uh, how uh, the, military, the nuclear power is, is rising with very little transparency. And also we need to be realistic about how China is cooperating with Russia. Well, uh, repairing for... Um, all those realities is something that uh, we need uh, to, to, uh, to achieve. Um, we are going to, we need, precisely in order to do that, we need to first strengthen our resilience of our societies, uh, which is also important. We cannot, uh, resilience is actually, uh, many people say that what's resilience, but resilience is included in the Article 3 of the Washington Treaty. All the countries must be in this position to help other countries if they suffer an attack. They must be ready. No, and resilience is key to save the world that readiness. You can, for instance, uh, let's say that uh, you have in critical infrastructure, strategic infrastructure like the 5G in telecommunications in the hands of an external power. This is a strategic vulnerability. We cannot afford that. What about dependencies on gas, of petroleum? We are seeing now what is happening. We need to diversify the sources. We need to gain resilience. We need to be resilient in order to be able to support allies. We need also to dip in political consultation among allies, but also with partners. It's important. Partnerships are very important. And finally, we need to invest in new technologies and maintain our age. The second focus area that I would like to highlight is that we need to ensure the collective defense of allies. This is our key purpose. This is our key responsibility to ensure collective defense. And also, we must do it across all domains and against any threat. In this regard, NATO has initiated, or initiated at the time, after 2014, uh, its largest reinforcement of collective defense. And Russia's invasion of Ukraine has dramatically altered the security environment in Europe, as you know. And that's the reason why Allies held an extraordinary summit in March, and they agreed to reset our deterrence and defense posture for the long term. <clears throat> the third idea that I will to talk about is that, uh, okay, we are facing a world of strategic competition, but also increased instability, especially in the South. We need to be prepared for potential situations in the region. We need to invest in crisis prevention and management capabilities, in particular training and capacity building for partners. And we need, it's important, to understand, mitigate as much as we can, and adapt to the impact of climate change in security. I insist in three words, no? Understand mitigate, and adapt. 
And the four key areas of focus is partnerships. Of course, we're working with others, uh, will remain key to enhancing our security. We need first to strengthen our support for vulnerable parties in our immediate neighborhood. There is no need to give more explanations. Uh, we need to strengthen capacity building with them, defense capacity building. We need to strengthen political dialogue. And we also need to step up our relationship with what we call like-minded partners, not only in Europe, but also in the Asia-Pacific region and elsewhere. And of course, it will be absolutely essential to continue strengthening our strategic partnership with the European Union. This is across a wide range of areas eh? and, of course, based on our common values that we hold. Well, to finish, the strategic concept is going to set a vision on how NATO is going to tackle <clears throat> these and other challenges, basically by aligning ends, ways, and means. But it's important, the strategic concept is also an opportunity for allies to come together and reaffirm their unity, common purpose, and principles. And this is precisely what we are going to do here in Madrid in a couple of weeks. I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm ready for your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Peco Yeste, uh, for your intervention as well. We will now take two questions for the public. If there are any, two very quick questions that can be answered in two minutes. Uh, there's one over there, I think. Yeah, if you can come up to the table and ask the question here. Good afternoon, I, I am Pedro Fisca. I am currently studying at the University of Navarre, but uh, now I am working at the uh, uh, Spanish Army General Staff in the Planning Division, but I'm going to ask just about the personal, not the Army uh, views. And Carmen Romero, Mrs. Carmen Romero has mentioned that China is going to have a, a proper weight in the, in the new strategic concept. Also, the, this issue has, has been arised. Um, although obviously I'm, I'm on the boat that we have to, to tackle and to provide a new relationship with China, but I'm afraid that a lot of people uh, from the alliance or from other countries can see this as an expansionist movement uh, by NATO at the same time that they argue that uh, the NATO, the eastern countries that came on NATO were somehow a threat for Russia. They can argue that mentioning China uh, or pointing China can be a threat to China. So how, how can we address this? How can we explain people uh, that um, this is normal that, that NATO doesn't want to, to expand on an aggressive way? Thank you so much. I can tell you, uh, related to Spain, that this is my vision, it's just my vision only, and it's just only one country among 30, you know? So I don't know what is going to happen at the end, because this is only a draft of the uh, new strategic concept, right? So I don't know. Um, this is a negotiation. So what does it mean that at the end we need a consensus? We need a paper? and we need an agreement among all the countries. And we are discussing. I'm just here at a, at a risk because my minister is right now discussing in Brussels. She has a press conference this afternoon and I don't know what is gonna happen. But before this meeting, I really know what does she think, which is, I think is, my, my point of view is close to her. I mean, for Spain, it's just China is opportunities and challenges. For United Kingdom, it's absolutely different. 
and for the United States, of course. And it's probably that they want to expand uh, the area of responsibility of NATO. And we have to discuss uh, to this. So I think that right now we have to wait for, because we are under negotiation. Um, from my point of view, I was really clear. I let you know what we think. I don't know what is going to happen at the, in the final document, but right now, this is the, the reality from the Spanish point of view. China, thank you for the question. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, I would say that um, the, 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 the key reason of NATO, the purpose of NATO, is to deter and defend allies. So, uh, we are determined that anybody enters, try to attack any territory, any part of the Allied territory, any part of the uh, Allied soil, etc. And actually, we have no global intentions. We do not pretend uh, to be a uh, war police. But uh, it's also true that uh, we are living in a global world, and therefore we need to think global. We need to have a global approach. So we need to put an eye on the Asia-Pacific region. We need to talk with New Zealand. We need to talk with Japan, uh, South Korea, New Zealand, Australia, Colombia. We need to talk without them. This global approach doesn't mean that NATO wants to span. And then our key purpose, I assure you, is to defend allies and deter external powers from attacking them. And <clears throat> it, our focus in China is not military at all. It's political, a political level, and uh, uh, we need to keep vigilant. There is a history, it's very interesting, no? Um, because every time in history that a new power has raised against the status quo, something has happened, something. Normally, war. We need to be vigilant about it. We need to avoid that. We need to establish channels of dialogue with China. And we need to engage with them in order to take advantage of opportunities. And insist, it's not a matter of global expansion. It's just a matter of putting an eye in all those regions that in order to fulfill a global approach. If I may, just uh, the, the former st strategic concept was designed for military operation, but the new ones are devoted to strategic communication. And uh, the NATO must communicate the potential threats external threats that NATO is concerned and prepare to cope with the military implication for security and defense of the coming challenges. But as well, and this is the most important goal for state communication nowadays, to communicate our populations that they are under a coming threat because Russia is following the, sorry, China is following the Russian way, is attacking us, um, spying, stealing, and competing uh, uh, in an, an unfair way. And we have problems in every multilateral or rule based organization. So, so we have to, to, to communicate to our people, they should be aware about. Of the coming threat. Other, other thing is how NATO will have to uh, cope with the coming threat. And now, but the, it is important from the strategic communication viewpoint to realize, to uh, raise the social and political awareness about the coming challenge. Because uh, otherwise, we will be, uh, we will continue living in this comfortable uh, life. Not forever, but for the few years. So. 
Yeah, so I would definitely love to continue with this uh, debate, but unfortunately we've run out of time again. Uh, so yeah, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate uh, to write them down and we will be very, very happy to just send those to the, to the panelists. So I want to thank you all three again for, for coming and, and sharing your opinions and views with us on this strategic concept. Um, thanks for coming and, and thank you for your interventions. I would love to ask my colleague, Secretary General Raquel Lorente, uh, to come to the floor and present the second panel of the afternoon, um, which we will celebrate before a nice coffee break. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to start with the second panel, Div Div Divergence of Objectives in Trust-Selecting Cooperation. And we have with us uh, Mr. Fernando Villena, who is a career diplomat and international affairs analyst at the Secretary General of Defense Policy at the Spanish Ministry of Defense. And we also have uh, Manuel Celas, Mr. Manuel Celas Gonzalez, sorry, which is uh, the current Deputy Director General for International Security Affairs and NATO and EU Security Director at the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so, um, Mr. Fernando Villena uh, um, is a career diplomat and um, uh, the uh, ministry, well, he was from uh, 2000 to 2004, 2006, consultant, uh, consult analyst for the foreign policy anal an analysis and forecasting office at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he also uh, uh, did uh, some years research analysis work with CCDN and uh, EAA. Uh, he also uh, worked with the you know, uh, at the um, Subdirector General in the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Subdirect of No Proliferation and Disarmament. And he is also current uh, analyst political advisor in the COES Ejempol at the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has also uh, written in many publica publications such as the, uh, the Limitation of Law of Armed Conflicts, New Means and Methods of Warfare. And uh, Mr. Manuel Celas Gonzalez. Uh, has a, a law degree from the University of Salamanca. He also did his military service at the Air Mobile Forces of the Army in the first attack helicopters <laughs> battalion. Uh, he also did the course of high national defense studies. And he has extended career in different areas and places around the world, such as, for example, the Spanish Embassy in Amman, or, or the Spanish Embassy in Belgrade. He also was uh, for five years from 2015 to 2019 a uh, political counselor at the Spanish permanent uh, representation to NATO in Brussels. And he's currently uh, the Deputy Director General for International Security Issues at the Director General for Foreign Policy and Security at the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I feel very honored uh, to have the opportunity of being here with you trying to explain my point of view on all this issue about NATO and the European Union, Europe, and the relationship between uh, both uh, sides of, uh, of the Atlantic. And of course, it's an honor for me to be with, to share this table with uh, Mr. Sellas, who is indeed much more uh, uh, whose knowledge is uh, much, much bigger than, uh, than mine, because I have to say that my world is the world of concepts, the ideas, and it's very comfortable to live there, but uh, Mr. Sellas is boots on the ground. He really is on the, on the issue and knows every single detail. So if you allow me, I'm not going to uh, start this intervention uh, just talking about the history of NATO. Uh, I, I guess that it's late, it's hot, you're bored, and I guess that uh, you have heard quite a few times all this story about the um, NATO was born to counter the uh, Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapsed. NATO lost the reason of being. Since then, it's been looking for it. Thanks to Mr. Vladimir Putin, now we've got a new sense of purpose. And now we are trying to elaborate uh, this new situation because we are in a new situation. During these last weeks, we have been hearing continuous reference to the good relations between the European Union and NATO. Speeches about how complementary these two organizations are, about the common goals and same values and principles. And nevertheless, 
from a more geopolitical and historical point of view, I believe that it's worthwhile to take a few steps back and try to analyze this relationship with a more critical eye. I believe in the transatlantic relation, but I also believe that in order to create a healthy relationship, both parties have to be honest and put on the table the misunderstandings and problems in order to openly deal with them. And I say to create a relationship because the previous one is somehow obsolete, and that's something that you have been heard, uh, hearing before. So I'm going to jump, as I said before, all this uh, historical approach, and just let me say that we are well aware that uh, the time of the only superpower is coming to an end. And it's of paramount importance to identify the current incoming rhythm, the current language in international relations, and to identify what kind of international order we want and which one is realistically attainable. That's to say, we need to establish the right, the right NATO strategy for the next years, which implies to take into consideration the fact that, the, that Europe and the European Union have a fundamental say in the designing of this policy. In order to identify the current script in international relations, it's worthwhile to have a look to the writings of authors such like uh, Merzheimer or Kissinger. And some of you might think that this might be a little bit too much of a realistic approach. But I'm afraid that other powers like Russia and China, among many others, have already set the stage. And there is nothing we can do but to admit that rules, international rules, are useful as useful in the international states, as serious is the commitment on the part of the powers to comply. It's my belief that the incoming international system is going to be a sort of, and you will have to buy this, because otherwise there's no way to go on with this speech, that the international system is an imperfect, bipolar, realistic international order characterized by a changing geometry, little by little. It's imperfect by bipolar, because there will be not a real iron curtain. There will be, indeed, two gravitational poles, the USA and China. But there will be also regional poles of attraction, like Turkey, Iran, Russia, India, Europe, that will define their international relations and partners accordingly to their interest, both occasional and permanent interest. Let me put an example with China. For the European Union, China is to be considered as a rival in terms of geopolit geopolitics, a competitor in terms of economy, and a partner in terms of a global commons, and all these at the same time. On the other hand, for the USA, Beijing is mostly an adversary, and this label qualifies China, China more as an enemy than simply as a competitor. The European Union, mostly, resists this American approach, and this might represent a serious line of fracture in future and faraway geographical scenarios like Taiwan, Southeast China Sea, and the Pacific Ocean, or in subjects like the outer space or the 5G internet, the global market, and the international finance system. I dare to say that China and the Western world are on a cross course on all those subjects. How will we deal with the incoming conflict? Is it going to be a competition, rivalry, or open animosity? Another great example of this change in geometry focus might be seen in the foreign and security policy of Turkey. Turkey is member of NATO, partner of Russia, and he's asking for a membership in the European Union while openly defying the very existence of Cyprus and Greece. And at the same time, all in all, ignoring the globally accepted law of the sea. How is Ankara considered by France, by Italy, by Greece, or by USA? How would react the European Union to an aggression? And the USA? These are, all the, uh, these are uh, from my point of view, the very root questions that should be made in order to elaborate in the future uh, the foreign policy of, uh, uh, in both sides of the Atlantic. This reasoning takes me to the realist side of this incoming international order. 
If we take into account the current criticism and attacks to some international organizations like the UN, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, and the World Bank, we might come close to understand the current poor health of the international law. This is just a testimony that the realist theories are back to shape the national foreign policies and international relations, and this is so whether we like it or not. The immediate consequence of all of this is that security becomes the main concern in the design of national policies. China has made incredible advances in the hybrid threats and in the gray zone conflict. Both are just ways to ignore the international laws without assuming responsibilities. And Russia just put on the table the use of force in its relations with other states, something that was formally forbidden, a sort of anathema in international relations, and yet, here we are. We are in dire need of diplomacy in these coming years in order to help states to navigate these new waters, forging new agreements and shaping norms accepted by every main power in order to avoid, as much as possible, the use of force in international relations. This is the 21st new brave world we've got before us. The question is what kind of world we want and what what kind of world we can get. Nowadays, threats to the Western way of life based on democracy and liberty come anytime from everywhere. And the best way to deal with it is on a stable international stage. An international order based on rules, but rules have to be accepted and respected by the main players. Otherwise, they are just words in the wind. I'm afraid that the open proclamations on the part of NATO and the European Union calling for a rules-based international order might differ. And in any case, they must probably collide with the concepts that other powers might have in mind. So far, the rules-based order is underpinned in a system of global governance that has developed since the Second World War. The United Nations has been considered to be at the heart of this rules-based order, based on liberal democracy, capitalist market economy, human rights, and the rule of law. But these patterns of cooperation that have benefited prosperity and security for decades are now under increasing strain. Does the USA, NATO, and the European Union intend to go back to the previous statu quo? In fact, is it possible? Or even more, is it advisable? Maybe the so-called universal values and principles were not, at the end of the day, that universal. And if so, is the Western world ready to compromise with the liberal powers for the sake of peace and prosperity? Do we want to create a new international order mechanism aimed at just managing competition between states with divergent val values? Are we going to a sort of redefinition of international order based on the balance of powers? The risk is too high, and we indeed need to agree on some standards and some norms, some procedures to reduce the level of risk and miscalculation. The current Biden administration might agree, but future US administration might differ. In today's multipolar world, or imperfect bipolar world, middle powers must do more to build a framework for managing powers competition. Working with like-minded countries to defend democratic values is one part of the job. But in order to produce an order that can forestall catastrophic conflict, Western powers will probably have to work more with many differently-minded countries. Is this a common understanding on both sides of the Atlantic? Because if we have just a look to our historic and tradition, uh, di diplomatic tradition, we can see that Europe tradi traditionally tends to focus on how to cohabitate with neighbors of different nature. Just uh, uh, maybe, I'm not going to come into the, into the Westphalia agreements in 1648, but th that's the basis. On the other hand, 
The traditional USA international projection has been, and still is, somehow, inspired by an idealism that, ten that tends to consider the political and economic system as the only possible way of reaching the most desired peace among nations. And even if Europe and the USA share their respect and commitment to the values of democracy, individual freedom, and the rule of law, the way these values inspire international relations differ. And probably the latest example is the reaction of the, some NATO allies to the declarations on the part of Germany and France trying to keep open the diplomatic uh, uh, conversations with uh, the Kremlin. Therefore, what I'm trying just to explain here and just to sum summarize is that uh, this is a new world. This is not a, let's say, we are not living an era of changes. We are living a change of era, which means that the precedent uh, law, the precedent political structures in terms of international relations, they are being questioned at best, if not openly defied. Defy. So, our responsibility, I guess that that's a big responsibility for the uh, security concept that is going to be part, uh, approved here in a few weeks, is just try to understand the world we are living in and of course the world that, that, that is coming and indeed the world that we can or we want to make in the future. And let's try mm, to forget some of the lessons that we have learned during the Cold War or maybe during the 90s. That's past history. That's history, 100%. And I think I'm going to stop here just in order to have the opportunity to have a little conversation with you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Villena, for your intervention. And now we are having Mr. Selas. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Um, and I say Raquel, I don't say Mrs. Lorente, because Raquel is working with me for the past uh, six months. Uh, we will deeply appreciate her, and I will take the opportunity today to thank her for uh, her job uh, and her commitment in our uh, unit, because she's living. Uh, it's, it's a pity, but uh, she will uh, spend. She won't. She wouldn't spend the summer with us, uh, and she would. But I, I, I take advantage of this opportunity to thank her, and also to thank Fernando, because uh, well. I met Fernando 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, I think. Um, so it's been a while, and now we're talking together in the same table. Who, who would say that? No, you know? not me. Not me. <laughs> well, um, well um, as uh, Raquel has uh, read from my CV, I'm the current Deputy Director for International Security Issues, which means that I have uh, the post of Director for Security either in the European Union and in NATO. It gives me uh, actually a right, the, probably the best uh, place to see how things develop either in the European Union, in, in NATO, in, this, in these times where uh, security and defense is everything. And I have to say, Raquel is a witness of that, that is uh, everything for everyone. Uh, everyone that is going on a trip from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, these days is asking for info and we have to write a note, and we have to give info, and we have to brief. And, um, and I have only three diplomats. I have no more than that. Um, in the Ministry of Defense, they have how many in the, in the campo? Like, like 74 or something. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a nice moment to, 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 to see how things are developed from this post. Uh, of course, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that, but actually I'm happy that I have the opportunity to be there in this, in this time. From that point of view, and I will, I will start my speech about the divergences between uh, Euro-Atlantic and European security and defense models. Um, the baseline is that uh, being together or being united is, does, doesn't mean that uh, we think alike. We are different. Uh, we have different national interests. We have different purposes regarding security and defense. We have different uh, defense cultures in, in every uh, country in the European Union and, of course, on the other side of the Atlantic. So what, what is really something, uh, let's say, surprising, amazing, is that uh, after 70 years, we are still together in a security, military, political alliance. So that's the achievement. Of course, there's potential route of collision. I will uh, later uh, go into them. 
but we have managed for 70 years, more than 70 years actually, to go together uh, from both si sides of the Atlantic. I will also have uh, this opportunity to confront uh, Felix, who has already gone, but I, I, what, I have, what I'm going to say, I told him before he left, uh, that we have succeeded in our deterrence because it's Ukraine who has been invaded. It is not Li Latvia, it is not Lithuania, it is not Romania, it is Ukraine. So I have challenged him to, to show me any plan, any GPR from NATO, where it says that our deterrence was directed to avoid the Ukrainian invasion, because that kind of plan does not exist. Of course, we are not happy when a close uh, neighbor and uh, partner is invaded. Uh, we have tried, we have done our best to avoid that. But link this to, the, to NATO deterrence, not the best option from my point of view. Of course, it's debatable, and I will debate with Felix, which is a good friend. I've been debated with him since the 24th of February, actually, so, because it's not the first time that I've listened to him to say, to say that. Okay, so come back to that uh, line of uh, being together doesn't mean thinking alike. Um, before uh, the global strategy 2016 European Union, the division of labor between NATO and the European Union was closely related to that of soft power for the European Union, hard power to NATO. That was something, I would, it, it was almost another line, another baseline for the European defense. But when the European Union progresses in the integration of the countries, at the end of the day, if you want to become a global actor, you need power, hard power. And this is something that everyone has forecasted for a long time. Uh, we have to have in mind that the first big initiative on European defense was a common army. It was late in the 50s. Uh, it was promoted by the French, and it was uh, uh, ranked by the French. So well, there was a balance in, in the movement. Um, so everyone feeling, and their feelings about the European integration is related to having something in common to defend the Union. But the thing is, uh, we had NATO. Uh, how can we combine that? Well, there was, there was uh, ideas in the Global Strategy 2016, but I have to say there's more ideas in the strategic uh, compass. Well, I have participated in the um, drafting of the strategic compass. I'm participating in the drafting of the strategic concept. I can talk about the strategic concept. There's people talking about the strategic concept. Okay, good for them, but it's classified. So I, I was a little surprised <laughs> about people talking about the strategic concept, uh, talking about the numbers of draft. Well, good, <laughs> good for him. Uh, it was wrong, actually. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot tell the number, but it was a wrong figure. So if you want to talk about figures, you, you should be precise. Um, but I cannot talk about the strategic concept. Now I can talk about the strategic compass. I wrote a piece about the strategic compass when the compass was classified. Uh, and it was published by Politica Exterior. So I think at the end of the day, it has kind of value. Um, there were some ideas in the strategic compass about how to combine that when the European Union wanted to become, let's say, carnivore, and, the, and NATO wanted to become herbivore. Because there was two initiatives at the same time, and uh, I, I thank you for the introduction of the initiative NATO 2030, because NATO 2030 is a political adaptation of, of the organization, because NATO felt, at the same time that the European Union felt they need hard power, NATO felt that the deterrence in the military terms were not enough. There was, they they need what, the, what NATO calls non-military means of power, which is something that surrounded the pure military thing. And at a certain point, it is, uh, it is what triggers, actually, or amplifies the response in, uh, in, 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 in present day. And we have seen that in the Ukrainian crisis and the, the Russian aggression, the combination of the sanctions and the military reinforcement. NATO has not uh, responded militarily to the aggression to Ukraine because it was considered escalating, etc. cetera. Uh, but the European Union has already done that through the EPF, the European Peace Facility, and the, uh, the access to uh, the, 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 the supply of uh, military equipment, either little or non-lethal, to Ukraine uh, through this mechanism. So 
there was this uh, exceptional uh, and successful ways of implementing uh, security and defense through both organizations. Where's, where are the gaps? Where are the potentials root of collision? Where are the weak points? Well, there is some obvious one from the, from the first uh, moment, and both the three uh, persons that, that they have uh, precedes us, they, they have presented the case, which is, at, at this point, national interest of the U United uh, uh, States, national, or the sum of the national interest of the European countries. That's uh, essential and pillar, um, because the US is uh, ally number one. Uh, it, it will, I mean, 75% of the capacities of the alliance belong to the US, 75%. I'm not talking about budget. There was this, this Trump trick about the, the US paying the 75% of the budget of, the, of NATO. That, that, that's wrong, that's a lie. The, the, the United States is paying 20.8% of the budget of NATO. 22.8%, not 75. 75 is the capacities, uh, talking about the military capabilities of NATO, that uh, the U.S. Um, contributes to the organization. So there's this national interest uh, of uh, the U.S. Um, and there's two different views of national interest in the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. So even inside the United States, we can have, we can, we, there's chances that the national interest is not exactly the same. That, that would be more accurate from my side. This is not exactly the same interest, and we have seen that in the Trump administration and now in the Biden administrations. So first point, uh, the, the most important ally has national interest and with a content which is not the same than the European one. Uh, second, uh, second point, it was not so visible before the Russian aggression to Ukraine, but now it's quite visible. Uh, defense industry. The money is what we call the Jerry Maguire effect. Show me the money. That's, that's it. Uh, because except a limited number of countries, and France is one of them, industries, defense industries, and the, uh, let's say, universal capitalist principle of benefit. You need profit. If you are a company, a defense industrial company, you need profits. You will not go in the direction of producing some kind of capabilities if you are not going to be paid. If you don't have economies with this kind of capability. So that more or less guides the interest of the industry. Now, after the aggression of, uh, the Russian aggression of Ukraine, there's a surplus of budgets to go to the defense industry. Um, before that, there was some kind of uh, principle of agreement between Europe and the US about how will, will we develop capabilities in NATO and the European Union. The European Union has started to launch these uh, collaborative uh, initiatives on uh, development of capabilities, such as PESCO, such as the EDAP, which is commonly known as the EDF, but the EDF, the European Defence Fund, is just the, the instrument of the European Defence Action Plan. So the EDF is not a programme, it's not a plan. The EDF is a financial instrument of the uh, European Defence Action Plan. Uh, because we... We saw at that point, and I was already involved in that, that if we go on with this uh, kind of, uh, uh, let's say, initiatives, we were losing ground. You cannot dedicate a PESCO project to develop a capability in 10 years if the Americans, they have already it. What's the point? You should go towards technologies, capabilities, with, a, with an added value, I mean, Felix Arteaga also pointed out on this, when you have to replenish uh, your arsenals, when you have to go through new uh, capabilities for, for your armed forces, you need to go not to those capabilities which are already out of date, uh, but you have to go to those that are going to be essential in the future. You have to, be, you have, to, to have foresight. And talking about the uh, defense industry, that foresight sometimes go further than 15 years. Because develop, we're talking about the FCAS, the, the, the future, uh, combat uh, air system for Europe. Uh, we are injecting millions of euros, or thousands of millions of euros already. Uh, nothing maybe before the decade of the later 40s, and we are in 2022. Uh, we have injected already more than 3 uh, billion euros. Uh, so, I mean, we have to think 
big, we have to think in, 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 with a lot of future. And then there's a root of collision. Uh, we cannot go where we cannot get something first, which is, uh, you, I mean, which is in the front line when you receive it. And second, you should not put money in something what is already invented. Third, uh, we're talking about Versailles declaration, renewal of uh, resources on uh, the industry of defense, the entry of the commission in the, um, uh, in the game, which is a big change because, you know, Article 41 of the European Union Treaty uh, prohibited the use of uh, common budgets for uh, military uh, affairs. Uh, it is an intergovernmental uh, domain, but with this trick by the Commission that they are supporting a European industry, which is the, as European as the agriculture industry or the car uh, producing industry or whatever, then we have the alibi to, alibi to uh, put money in defense industry and use the, the, the common budget of the European Union, which is where the big money is. Because in the governmental um, domain, uh, you have to put money in, in the Spanish case, is eight, this year is 8.76%, uh, I think, which is our quota for any uh, extra governmental funds in the European Union. Well, that's a lot of money for something that is not going to be, you, you know, as useful as something that you are going to get on national basis. So this is the, the second route of collision is money uh, and, in, and defense industry. And the third one is the, the sense of purpose. Uh, and this is something which is not so, uh, let's say, too evident. Because we share values in the, I mean, we share democratic principles and values. Uh, we share um, even um, uh, the diagnosis of the challenges, threats, and opportunities uh, of, the, of, the, of our uh, security environment. We've seen that in the strategic compass already. We will see it in the strategic concept. Um, because we live in the same, uh, let's say, geographical area. But it's not so evident that the principles that we wanted to state uh, for the future of Europe after these Russian aggressions are going to be the same that, uh, as I, or as it is perceived at the other side of the Atlantic because our big ally has different sensitivities about what are going to be the future challenges. And here the, game, the name of the game is China. So we do not perceive China as a territorial adversary. We cannot because it's not. I mean, we have a huge chunk of of land in between Europe and China, of course, we will feel the effects of uh, an emerging China. Everyone will feel that effect. But those effects uh, are enough uh, to consider China an enemy? Who knows? Uh, but it's a, it's a dangerous play. Um, you should not put your finger in the, in the eye of the bear. Uh, and I'm not referring to Russia, about, about the bear now. Um, so you have to be very careful uh, talking about this and, what, and talking about what you are going to develop to face that challenge. In that regard, both the strategic compass and the strategic concept are public documents. So they have a, a deterrence value in itself because you are telling others what are you going to do if some kinds of events happen, normally against you, your societies in the military or the economic or the political um, domain. In that case, it was easy to handle in the European side because the strategic uh, compass is not really that uh, strategic paper that uh, is going to f guide the, the security and defense of the European Union for the next 10 years. When you, you, start, you start reading the strategic compass, you see a lot of dates. You see 2022, 2023, 2025. You, you wouldn't find any date in the strategic concept. There was none in the Lisbon concept. There's not going to be anyone in the, in the Madrid context, more, more likely. Why? Because the strategic concept for, 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 the, for NATO, it, it is like a building which has been built for the past 70 years, and when you are Doing a new concept, you are like you know refurbishing the, the rooms. You are changing the tiles. You are putting new stairs. You are uh, putting elevators. You are the the strategic compass is like they have given us a plot to build, and they have even they have given us some materials. 
that we have to use compulsory because one of the uh, elements of the strategic compass is uh, it was compulsory to um, take into account all the initiatives we have already launched and then alienate th those initiatives with those who are going to adopt in the future. So there was an element of coherence in the strategic compass uh, which is uh, which it, it forced you to use these old, let's say, uh, all, these old policies along with the new ones. So that's the big difference between the strategic compass and the strategic compass. And at the end of the day, is the big differences between the European Union and, and, uh, and the Allied uh, point of view regarding defense. The, the last point from my side about these potential divergences. I would have said from the beginning that there's people like me to avoid these kind of divergences. We have been so successful so far. I hope we will be successful in the future. But we have been able to avoid them for the time being, but we can talk about that. Um, and, and the last one, um, uh, it is uh, related to um, what are we going to do with uh, Russia when, it, when this finish? What will the end game? Um, and there's a different, there's different sensitivities already. I mean, it's, it's in the press. It's not something that I'm going to uh, disclose. I mean, there, there, there's different sensitivities about uh, what we, we need to do, in, even inside the European Union, because uh, there's also divisions in the European Union regarding the issue. There's not the same thoughts in the flank, in the member states of the eastern flank uh, and the rest. And also in, in NATO, because there's a, n a number of uh, countries which are not members of the European Union, they, they don't have the same, view, the same views, and they have even uh, different agendas, as Fernando has uh, said in a number of times about, about Turkey. Turkey considers itself uh, a power in their area, so it, they, feel that, they feel that they deserve a, um, a singular line of policy by themselves. So this is a national interest that should be accommodated with the others, uh, and sometimes they put themselves in the same uh, position that the Americans or the British or, or the French. It is, it is not, not easy to handle. And I've been sitting uh, just close to the, to the Turkish, uh, the four years I've been in NATO, because this, in NATO you sit uh, around the table following the, uh, the alphabetical order. So we are, Spain is between Turkey and Slovenia. So the four years I've been sitting between a Turkish guy and a Slovenian guy. So I know Turkish very well <laughs> and how they, how they perform and what they want to. So this, this will be talking about potential divergences uh, between the Euro-Atlantic uh, security model and the European security model. These are potential, um, uh, let's say, divergences. But as I said before, we have been able to overcome all of them for the time being. There's no, I mean, there's, we have seen the common uh, response uh, facing the Russian aggression. Uh, we have seen common responses on how to deal with the supply of military equipment. Not NATO, but the US are supplying, the British are supplying. You have, probably you have heard about the Ramstein meeting in Germany and how it's been used um, uh, performing with uh, the already existing structures of the EU military in Europe and, uh, and the support of other allies um, and they are dealing with really a huge amount of uh, military equipment to be prepared, packed, and sent to the Ukrainian armed forces. So we have already been able to overcome a lot of different uh, problems where there's different, for sure, point of view from every side of the Atlantic or even uh, different view inside the same European Union. So those divergences exist. I have already commented on them. Uh, but uh, hopefully we have already overcome them and will continue to overcome them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Villena and Mr. Celas, for such an interesting intervention. Now uh, we'll have a, a, a coffee break. And unfortunately, well, first we'll have time for two questions, I think, if someone wants to. OK. So it's really interesting to hear, especially Mr. Fernando Villa talking, because um, you talked about like bad news and maybe like the new path, like how should we look at the future. 
And um, we, uh, in this group, we talked a lot about that further today, like about democratic values, how should we proceed with the democratic values like within NATO, but also in a more global and interconnected world. Uh, because we've seen before that, like in Libya, Afghanistan, in different countries, we have seen that Western countries have tried to like push forward democratic values into countries where it hasn't been really uh, like maybe a positive outcome. So um, how can we kind of uh, defend and protect the democratic values in the world that now we see is going in a more autocratic way and kind of respect? like each countries and their development, but at the same time kind of defend our own alliance. I think that's maybe, um, yeah, an interesting topic for the future, and especially for us as youths, uh, because we are interested in like, sustainability, but sustainability for all, all countries, and not just like in the NATO alliance. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, I'm, well, uh, nevertheless, I, I'm not quite sure if I got correctly the, 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 the question itself. So far, I think that, uh, well, the truth is that I'm not going to provide answers here, but to develop the possibility of posing the right questions. That is not a little achievement. Uh, uh, and the right question is what kind of world do you want in the future? what kind of world you can get in the future. And maybe, maybe to reconsider all of those so-called granted statements that we've been uh, making during the last 20 years, like uh, universal values or universal principles that might not have been shared by everyone all around the world. Which is quite clear is that uh, a new international order is to be implemented somehow. Otherwise, anarchy is knocking on, uh, uh, on the door. Anarchy is not a good situation for the international relations, and it opens against, uh, as I said before, the, uh, the door to the use of raw force. That's not very uh, you know, attractive. So what can we do? As a, uh, in order to defend the Western, let, uh, let me uh, allow me to say Western values, democracy, the rule of law, uh, and individual li liberty. First and maybe first and foremost, just to uh, be a good example for the rest of the world. And secondly, maybe not to not to try to impose by force those values in places where they might not be prepared, ready to accept that kind of values, because simply it has never been their own, in, in their own culture. How to do, how, that, that, that's my point of view, and I, I'm European, I really believe in the possibility of uh, cohabitating and talking with uh, different cultures and, different, uh, and people who are not <laughs> thinking and do not share exactly the same values that I do. So, uh, and as an European diplomat, I think that the only way to go on and to try to get a understandable and acceptable international order is to talk and talk and talk and, and, and uh, show with your own example. Is this going to be enough? No, of course not, because challenges, they are not just the verbal challenges, as we can see. We also have been to be prepared to defend ourselves in a tough way, which, mean, which implies defense and deterrence. But as I said before, this is new ground, this is new path. Uh, the, exam the example of the 90s are not valid anymore. The Cold War and the Iron Curtain is not valid anymore. We might have to look even before in the history in order to find some kind of uh, parallelism that might inspire us. And uh, this is maybe our task, your task, our responsibility, to make the best world possible. Not as much as the one we want, but the one we can. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Villena, for your answer. And unfortunately, they are informing me that we are running out of time, so we'll have now the coffee break that will only last 15 minutes. So sorry for that. Oh, thank you very much again. Gutierrez Mellado and graduated from the U.S. Army Defense College and the NATO Defense College in Rome. He has served in operations in Bosnia Herzegovina with NATO and the EU. He is a lecturer in universities and military schools with more than 100 publications. He is also a senior analyst at the Spanish Institute for Strategic Studies, focusing on the Euro-Mediterranean area, North Africa and Sahel Jihadist terrorism, as well as USA, EU and NATO. He has uh, been uh, the Spanish representative in the Euro Maghreb Center for Strategic Studies of the 5 Plus 5 initiative. Thanks a lot, Colonel. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for your kind presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. And also, I have the honor to uh, share this time, these uh, few minutes, uh, talking about uh, NATO or threats to NATO. No? Uh, the, the topic of my short lecture is conventional and conventional threats. And as I was in the previous lectures, I know that many things have already been talked about, so I'm not going to repeat them. And I will focus on some points that I think they are relevant, especially if you, if you look at them from the southern border, from Spain. And I, will, and I think this is the added value that I can provide to this, to this session. Uh, I will use some slides because it's on purpose. I knew that this is the last session and you are exhausted, already exhausted, and thinking in going to Madrid and enjoying Madrid night. Uh, and so I need to take your attention and I think that when we talk about threats, some maps and some figures uh, help to illuminate the landscape. So when we talk about uh, NATO threats, Let's say that the global picture might look more or less like this. We have threats in the south, we have uh, threats in the, in the east, and we have uh, threats also uh, far away. Uh, some are real threats, some are emerging threats or risks or challenges or however you want to call them. And I will try to focus on, on the most important ones. Of course, these are conventional threats. Together with them, there are also some uh, non-conventional threats, as is uh, the cyber, uh, as is uh, also migration, etc. And I will, give, I will not talk that much about them because uh, I think that the main responsibility to deal with these threats are some different institutions like the European Union, which has more capabilities and more uh, tools uh, to tackle them. So the first threat, going very fast through the slides, uh, is uh, China. China, you have heard a lot about China. And you have also heard in the previous session that China was many things. It was a challenge, was a risk, uh, was also a partner in the economic field. But actually, I think that it's uh, uh, becoming a threat. For whom? Is it a threat for NATO? Well, not really for NATO. For NATO, is a, this is a combination of uh, different issues. But for our transatlantic partners, it's become, becoming or has become the real challenge for the 21st century, for the, for the American, for the US. And actually, uh, I was, uh, when I was preparing this lecture, I was uh, listening to uh, the Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, uh, a few days ago. She, uh, she delivered a, sp a speech in, uh, in Washington. And he stated a remark which is very important. He said, okay, don't forget that the real threat for the United States is not Russia, it's China. And, and that's, that's right, that's right. Uh, the, for the US, the big uh, challenge and the big, uh, for, for the 21st century, is China. China. Uh, the problem for, for China is that uh, during these last decades, in the turn of the century that when NATO and also the, the United States were focused on minor wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, yeah, etc., uh, China has emerged, has emerged. And now it's a big power and it's challenging the international orders. So do, you have two approaches. Uh, one approach is, okay, let's tackle China and try to reach agreements 
uh, with them in order to manage the war issues. And the other is to try to contain China. And this uh, uh, debate is also inside NATO. There are some countries that think that uh, we have to reach agreements uh, with China in order to prevent going to confrontation. And there are some hawkish nations that think that uh, China is becoming uh, a dangerous country and the, we have to try to contain uh, China. If you look uh, to the American thinkers and they are uh, coming to our or NATO uh, way of thinking, uh, many of them think, for instance, Mersheimer uh, thinks that China is doing the same that the United States did in the 19th century. It's emerging and is trying to become a a regional or hegemonic power in Asia the same way the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. did in America. And at the end of the, of the day, they will try to become the uh, hyperpower uh, of the world. And, well, that's a vision. Uh, probably there are arguments that uh, favor this vision, but there are some other arguments, and I am more in, in favor of them, that uh, say that, okay, we have to find a way uh, to deal with China other than confrontation, other than confrontation. Uh, the, the bigger th thinker uh, talking about this way of thinking is uh, Kissinger. No? Yeah, Kissinger, you know that he wrote a, a book on China, in the, it was published in 2012, and he said, okay, if you want to prevent the war with China, you have to identify the issues that are controversial issues and try to tackle them. And the first one is uh, Taiwan. So how to deal with Taiwan? The China are looking very closely at what NATO is doing in uh, Ukraine and is taking their lesson learns in order to advance their own positions in the uh, Asia Pacific. And this uh, course of action is becoming very dangerous because if you hear the uh, discourses of the uh, the main leaders of China and the United States, uh, you can come up with the idea that we are going towards a real confrontation be between these two, uh, two big powers. Uh, we just uh, a couple of days, we had the opportunity to hear the Minister of Defense of China saying that if someone is trying to take Taiwan out of China, we will use the military force to avoid it. And on the other side, we have heard also the President of the United States saying that we will defend uh, Taiwan militarily. If they stick to this position, uh, conflict is unavoidable. And what about NATO in this conflict? Okay, uh, sorry, but it's, it's not here. Well, the problem is uh, for NATO is uh, do we follow this uh, version of containment of China. And the first question mark that we can make ourselves is, is China, uh, can China be contained? Well, uh, actually most of the thinkers think that, that China has arrived to a point that it's uh, uncontainable. We cannot contain China. We, we could do that maybe 20 years ago, but uh, during the pandemics we learned the hard way that uh, China uh, has learned the way to prevail in a chaotic world and to, make, and to advance their interest over ours. So uh, this is one of the big question marks for NATO because uh, behind the strategic concept there is also this way of thinking. Once uh, Ukraine is done, and we think that sooner or later we will be done with this issue, uh, we have to tackle China. And uh, as you heard in the previous session, the word China will be mentioned many times in the strategic concepts. We don't know the final draft because they are still discussing that. But this idea of co containment of China will be there. And so for NATO, there are, there are two options. The first one is to keep NATO as a regional alliance and contain to the uh, territorial limits of the uh, Article 6 of the Washington Treaty, or to make NATO a global uh, alliance. There are some countries that favor one position and some the others. And my understanding is that it will depend on the result, the outcome of the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, my understanding is that the war in Ukraine uh, does not last too much. Sooner or later, the Americans will pass the bill 
and will say, okay, we have helped you to contain uh, Russia in uh, Eastern Europe. Now you have to help us to contain China in uh, the Asia Pacific. We are not sure about, about that because uh, you know that the politics in, uh, in America are also uh, very flexible and it depends on the political party and they have elections at the end of the years and a new president in two years. So that may, might change. But that is the question for, for China. Should NATO go to the Asia Pacific in order to contain China or should uh, remain as a regional alliance? Let's move fast uh, to the second uh, threat, which is Russia. And it's too late to talk about the mistakes of NATO strategy in the past. In my understanding, and I think there is many people that think that we have lost some uh, very good years to get a, a agreements with NATO, with, China, uh, with Russia, sorry. Because at the end of the day, we have common interest in Asia Pacific. Russia is a natural uh, competitor uh, with China, and they have a lot of uh, uh, li uh, limited or uh, territorial issues that have not been tackled so far. Don't forget that China lost uh, 25 of uh, its territory in the agreements with Russia in the 19th century. And China has something that uh, very few countries have, its memory. And we have heard uh, President Deng Xiaoping saying, okay, maybe we have lost the last uh, 500 years of, the of uh, diplomacy, but we are a whole nation with thousands of years. We can wait for our moment. So what about uh, Russia? For Russia, it's the same. Uh, we have a controversy, a controversy with, with Russia. And for me, it was very important, and I was very happy to hear uh, the, the ambassador, the previous diplomat here, saying, OK, don't forget that Ukraine is at war with Russia, but we are not. NATO is not at war with Russia. There is a public uh, mood, public opinion mood, uh, thinking or pushing in, that, in this direction. Uh, we, in a sort of way, we are in, at war with Russia, but we are not. And actually, the public opinion is also changing. I was reading just uh, yesterday a report from the European Council of Foreign Relations uh, stating that 35% of the Europeans in the European uh, uh, nations, average, uh, thinks that uh, times has arrived to reach an agreement with Russia. It is 22% that favor supporting uh, Ukraine to the, to the very end. And here, NATO is, has so far so a very cohesive and very uh, united approach uh, to the invasion uh, of Ukraine by Russia. But we are not sure how long this public opinion support will last. And we will see, because uh, we have heard just uh, last weekend uh, in an op-ed in the uh, New York Times, the President of the United States, Mr. Biden, saying uh, we have to make NATO, uh, we have to make uh, Russia pay a price for the invasion in order to prevent other countries to do the same in other scenarios. But the price uh, for, is not only for Russia, we are also paying the price. And we will pay a, a bigger price as the time goes on. But it's not only us, it's the rest of the world. We think that this is a, a world war against Russia, which is the aggressive power, and there is no doubt about that. But if we look at the world, and we heard before in the previous session also this point, there are many countries that do not align with our point of view. Actually, most of the countries in the, uh, out of the Western world do not align with our position. And we have to be aware of that. Uh, and even within our own societies, as the time goes on and the uh, circumstances of the war uh, degrades, uh, we will see if the public opinion is, uh, favors this massive support to Ukraine or push the, their governments for a, an agreement. Actually, for instance, just today, I was watching uh, the uh, French TV and uh, the President Macron was in Romania and he was stating this, uh, time is... Uh, getting closer to start negotiating with Russia. Now, uh, they are still fighting in the Donbass, but uh, sooner or later, they, there will be a moment that they, they will have to negotiate. 
the idea that uh, Ukraine can de defeat uh, Russia absolutely is uh, bizarre. Is bizarre, and probably some concessions will have to be made to Russia. It's not happy. Uh, it's not a happy end, and probably not happy, end, especially for the Ukrainians because they are the ones that we lost the most. Uh, but uh, for NATO, we have to also to take a decision uh, on how to finish this war because there are some other uh, challenges waiting in the hall. Going very fast because I'm running time of uh, running out of time. Ah, okay. So we cannot forget the South, and that's very important also for uh, countries like Spain, Italy, Portugal, France, Greece, etc. Because we are focused on uh, on the Eastern Front, but uh, there are also huge challenges uh, in the South. One of the biggest challenges right now is Libya. I don't want uh, to develop uh, extensively what's going on in Libya, but it's a, a chaos right now. Uh, we thought at the end of the last year that there was about to have uh, democratic elections, but these were put off for uh, January, and actually they, they will never at least in the foreseeable future, have elections. But what is concerning or relevant for NATO is that while NATO did, decided not to take an active role after the, the fall of uh, Gaddafi in uh, 2011, uh, other nations came in and they are the big or the bigger, the bigger actors or stakeholders in this, in this country. And that's very bad for NATO. Because Libya is just south of NATO. It's, it's a country that NATO should easily uh, manage. But it's not only Libya. It's also southern Libya, the Sahel. It probably, especially for, for those of you who are not, uh, do not live in a southern uh, European country, do not know too much about the Sahel. But Sahel is becoming uh, a very dangerous uh, region. Uh, for years, we trusted uh, our friends, par partners, and colleagues uh, to, to tackle this issue uh, alone with the uh, Serval operation, and after that, in 2014, with the Barkhane. But they are having a lot of problems, and Barkhane is about to end with uh, not a big success. These problems are there, and they are expanding. Once some areas in the Sahel are big are falling into the hands of the tourists, they are expanding to other regions and becoming a no-go uh, zone or a no-go uh, area from where the terrorist groups or jihadist or criminal groups can attack us. The problem for the Sahel is that uh, unlike uh, Russia, that uh, no one in NATO thinks is an existential uh, problem or an existential threat, only a few countries think that Sahel is an existential threat uh, for NATO. Uh, and they think it's a minor or secondary uh, issue, not at the same level as Russia or China. Together with this is the idea of the fragile states. During the last, the last year, since the uh, Strategic Council 2010, the main focus of NATO was the crisis management operation. Afghanistan was the critical example. But uh, after the failure of Afghanistan, we can call that like that, uh, there is very little appetite in NATO for new uh, operation Afghanistan style. So who will tackle the problems in these countries? Eh? Not only Afghanistan, but uh, Mali, the Sahel, Iraq, uh, the Horn of Africa, etc. My idea, and I think the ambassador previously mentioned that, and I'm going to the end of the, my lecture, is that we should use the capabilities of the European Union. You, the European Union has some appetite for this sort of operation. And from the military of point of view, they are not so uh, complicated or so demanding as it's a, a big war operation uh, in Eastern Europe. So it should be uh, very good for uh, the European Union to use the recently approved uh, strategic compass with that 5,000 uh, manpower capability to be used in this uh, scenario. So it should be a sort of uh, a split of responsibilities. NATO will do the, the big wars and the big uh, challenges 
uh, against threats like Russia and maybe in the future China. And the European Union will provide security in the neighborhood of the, of the borders, of the European borders, especially in the south. Finally, in a couple of minutes, two non, uh, uh, non military uh, threats. One is migration. NATO is not good to tackle migration, but migration is, a, is an issue. And the problem is not migrants coming in, in Europe. The problem is some uh, states using migration as a weapon for hybrid warfare to advance their political uh, purposes. We have seen it in Ukraine, uh, sorry, in uh, Belarus and Poland in uh, November last year, but we have also seen it in, in Spain in June last year. And maybe we'll see it in uh, coming weeks with Algeria, because now we have some issues with Algeria. They can use this uh, tool also to get some political advantage uh, from the uh, Spanish government, which at the end is a European and also NATO issue, because once uh, this volume, massive volume of uh, migrants are inside our borders, they disseminate all over Europe. And the other one, and I'm fi finalizing here, is the cyber. Cyber, you know, the uh, cyber was declared an operational domain by NATO in 2016. And NATO has had so far a, a very soft approach to cyber. The idea is, okay, cyber defense is a NATO responsibility, but cyber offense to use cyber capabilities to attack other countries, other groups, other people in other territories outside NATO borders, that's a national responsibility. Well, this is also something that is being discussed and we will see in the future how it evolves. Uh, but my understanding is that after Ukraine, many things will change in this domain and probably, most probably NATO will accept a bigger uh, role in the, child, in the cyber domain. I stop here, of course, many things uh, still waiting, but I don't want to run out of time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Colonel, for your intervention. As uh, the Colonel has said, as, as we, we know, uh, we are running out of time, so we have to be a, a bit fast now. Sorry, uh, Joel, for that. <laughs> so uh, now we are having Joel Rodri Diaz Rodriguez, who is a jurist and international affairs analyst and, collaborat and collaborator of the IEE. Uh, he's graduated in he's a graduated in law from the University Complutense, University Complutense of Madrid and masters in international relations from the Diplomatic School of Spain. He has worked in different international organizations and in the policy applied field as a political officer in the office of the Assistant Secretary General in the Organization of American States. Then he has worked in the delegation of the European Union to the United Nations and in the international security sections. And he has also worked in the in Director for External Relations at the Council of the European Union. In the academia, he has been teaching assistant and researcher in the Faculty of Law uh, in the University of Geneva. Uh, furthermore, he has taken part in different international forums and seminars, such as uh, the Graduate Study Program of the United Nations. And he's fellow of the, the Hawk Academy of International Law, and he's alumni from the National Defense Course from Young Professionals from the TCDN. And finally, he's an author of several articles on foreign policy and security affairs, as well as in Latin America relations. And currently, he's external, uh, he's external contributor of the IE. So thank you very much, uh, Joel. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I want just to start thank you the organization for this invitation. It's been an honor to me to be here this afternoon and also an honor to share the panel with Colonel like Ignacio that I had the pleasure to know before. So, and the pleasure to share with you some ideas and vision about what is NATO, new fronts, new challenge. And I have this precise but very precious moment to talk to you. So I would like just to go quickly to the main ideas. Um, as we know, we are living at very turbulent times. If I have a phrase that we can share with you, it's like we can say that, maybe you remember, no, Louis XIV, the king of France, when he died, he, he was dying, regretting himself about having loved too much the war. And probably when Putin will die, he will regret that he have unified Europe against Russia. And that is the main idea that I want to say, because like today, NATO came back 
to the main task of deterrence. And probably this is something new, but it's not, because like if you remember, in, during the last three years, so no more than that, we were debating about many challenges that NATO was like experiencing. For example, as we mentioned before, we were open the reflection process in 2019 about what was the future for NATO. And that is very important to take in, in, in mind because from this point we have evolved many things until this moment that came in February 24 with the Ukraine war. So that put NATO in the first line and reinforced the idea that NATO has to be the key element of the defense of Europe. But this is not exactly the same, because at the same time, we were living a moment on which the European Union were increasing their power in the defense, we can say, in the defense aspect. And they came in March with the, this strategic um, and compass. But how can we put together these two moments? In the same moment, I think that everybody has the impression that NATO is taking the lead, and European Union has been before, have lost a lot of the allure of the moment. But we can say that it's very important to take into, into that there are two pieces of the, same, of the same architecture, the reinforcement of European Union and NATO. And then when we go to the next, NATO is a story of success. And this has to keep in mind this idea, because the evolving nature of NATO has been present since their creation. And this is the main idea that today we are reinforcing NATO to adapt NATO to the new challenge of the 21st century. Exactly, and there are two factors that I would like just to highlight just to start. The first is the evolution of this nature is thanks to the dynamic of the relations or the transatlantic relation between the United States and the European powers. And the other factor that have moved NATO to evolve is the rivalry with Russia. Now, with this context, putting this idea in the, in the current context, we have to say that NATO came again to the main task of deterrence. And why do you think, why he's talking about that he came now to the main task? Because during, since 1991, especially, NATO, when the Cold War ended, we came with the idea that NATO, we need to look for another reason of being of NATO. And then we went internationally. We went to like do other operations out of the area. In, in, in popular terms, we can say that we let the green uniform, we put the blue helmet, and we start doing different things that we were, for, we were created. But this changed in 2014, when we have the Crimea aggression. And then we start thinking about that we were too international, we were too global, and we need to come back to the main task of deterrence and the protection of the territorial defense of Europe. The second idea that I want to, to share with you is that from this moment, we can say, and this is something that I, I call it, we live in a multidimensional challenge times, and especially for NATO. Why? Because we found that we have different challenges. We have external ones. We have more threatening Russia that is fearful that the expansion of the alliance to the east. We have also the new rising of China as a revisionist power, as Colonel have remarked. Also, we have instability in the south, in the south of, in the, south of the Mediterranean, area that is less visible, but doesn't mean less danger. So less dangerous, I'm sorry. And also we have another like fronts, another threats that are not especially the same. We were more used to, 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 focus, to think about the Easter flood when we have in mind airplane, Russian airplanes crossing the lines, attacking the West, but never think about what the other threats, the evil threats that are in the South, in the, in the Sahel, that are less visible, but are more important and also are important because in the Southern flank, we have a more important divide that is the political, we'll, we are talking about between democracies, consolidated democracies and failed states, most of them. We also have a socioeconomic division that we have more or less the, the line that divides the South Front is divided between that double in terms of living standards between the countries from the other, um, another side of the Mediterranean. And also we have a place where there's hybrid threats, terrorism, and we have also like um, new threats that are not really perceived by the population. When poverty, 
when stability came, this is a perfect place for terrorism and also like for um, threat our own security. And then also came with a new idea that um, when we talk about these new fronts, we forgot one that is also mentioned by the coroner, but it's very important. And now I would like to say that this is a new battle frontier is the cyber space front. And why is it special? Because we have, the, we have experienced the threats in disinformation, in the attacks to our systems. And, and why do you think that is very important? Because it attacks the people, the citizenships, attack also our like own courts, our democracies. And that is important for that. This is became the new front of the 21st century. And this is mixed with all the different threats that we are living, like a hybrid. How can we define if an attack, for example, the Salisbury attack in London, there are hybrid, there are like, it's a conventional and conventional attacks. This is the importance to define very clear what's the threat that we are living or we are facing today. So going just quickly to just not repeat ideas, I would like to say that the new battle that we are living against Russia put again the deterrence of the NATO. But exactly as, for example, like the director, uh, Manuel Sela said, NATO never failed to protect the, the, the member states because Ukraine was never like a member of NATO. But it's true that this remains some idea in our mind if it's NATO have in, or and the EU have enough, the power enough to deter Russia about these adventures. This is what we have in mind. What happened, not only break, we can say the peaceful settlement that we have in Europe since the end of the Cold War, but always I would like to say that, that broke the peaceful agreement that we have since Helsinki agreements in 1975, when Russia and the, and the Western powers agree to, about the new borders in Eastern Europe. So this is not about if NATO became or not relevant or was attacked or not. It's like we have a settlement in Europe that now has been broken, and how can we respond to that? It's a new task that we need to define. Then second, also, as I started, like when I said that Putin unified Europe, that is clear that we have a very important step given by the two nations, Sweden and Finland, that they already sign up and apply to join NATO. And this is an important uh, milestone, we can say. Why? Because if you think about Sweden broke a rule of neutrality of more than 100 years in Finland in the Second World War. So why they are open to break this rule, this neutrality policy? Because they fear that Russia doesn't respect the agreements and, and Russia can go for new adventures. Being in NATO means that you will be protected by the umbrella, but most important for NATO, and this is also an, an, another idea that I would like that you keep in mind, is that Sweden and Finland joining NATO will be so important because they will reinforce the political aspect of the common values. Maybe everybody knows about the, famous, the, the so famous Article 5, but never talk about the Article 2 that is less known but very important too. So it, this is article is about the values that the alliance changed. And we don't have to forget that NATO is an alliance, political alliance, and also a military alliance that share values, democratic nations, and that we, NATO, like we live in an, and we believe in an international order ruled by international law. When this settlement is broken by another nation is when we have to come together, and this is why I came with the idea that at the end, the aggression just bring a new union for the NATO nations and also for the EU that have to respond together to the same threat. As I said, another idea that is very important to say is that the new front, I don't want to like get in, in every front because I think I don't want to repeat the coronal that he well explained, but I would like to focus also, as I said, in the eastern flank, just briefly. NATO was prepared better for the eastern uh, threats than the, from the southern threats. And that is uh, uh, something clear. When you think about the, the, the reflection process, we were thinking about to rebalance the two flanks. With the new aggression of, of Russia, we are thinking that we need to come back to reinforce the eastern flank, 
But also we don't need to forget that we were thinking about that that Southern also posed many challenges, many threats for countries like Spain, and also for our own security. What is happening there could affect what is happening here. So the second idea that I would like to just remark is about the cyber, cyber security new front. It's important to say because it also affects things that we are living next to each other. Internet of the things, we are living something that can affect. They, the new powers like Russia, they know exactly what is the intensity of managing these kind of arms that can affect, they can reach you. They can read your phone, they can reach our society, they can change our perception about reality. And this is, can be very threatening for our democratic society. We, can see, we saw already that, this intromission in the, this meddling, we can say, in the 2060 election in the US. Also, we, can, we also know that there were some interventions in the Catalan election in 2017. So we need to think about the danger of, of this kind of threats, and we need to come together. It's true, for example, as the Colonel mentioned, that in 2018, we came with this idea that um, Secretary General Stoltenberg mentioned that an attack to a cyber attack that could affect to high level of um, capacities could be understood as an attack to all, and, thank, and that can activate the Article 5. But for example, this same idea and I would like to share with you, I was talking last week with the vice um, head of the Spanish delegation to NATO assembly, and he was telling me that there's no a clear agreement on that, for example. For example, the, the US parliamentary, the, the congressman in this meeting, they were in the last meeting in this season, they were, he was telling me that they were not clear if this attack can affect really some capacities, don't need to be, understood as a real attack. Wow, that means that there's no a clear agreement on what kind of attacks can imply an activation of Article 5. This is important. We need to come together to define what is, is important to send a message to these um, adventurers that want just to subvert our international order, no? our international system with these attacks. The other idea that I would like to share with you is about something that I think that is important also to mention that it's like every panelist today have mentioned, it's about the renewal balance of power in the international arena. We know that China is a revisionist power. He wants to subvert the world according to its interests. And we need to come together with this idea from the most conceptual like, um, aspect that we need like an alliance on which the United States and Europe need to come together. Because this is the only uh, um, way that we can face a more assertive rush, a more assertive China that want to rebalance this order. Second, Russia. As we see, it, Russia doesn't have their own path. Sometimes Russia, we can think that they behave more like a 19th century imperial nation than a 21st century power. And it is true, because today Russia is more, is more prisoner of their fears than of their ambitions. And this is important to understand that we need to respond, again, from the most political aspect, with asserting that we need to talk to Russia. It's not about to face Russia with military capacity. We need to be very assertive in what is our position, and we need to try to respect and, dis and per se persuade them of new adventures. This is the order that we want. If we want peace, we need to also be prepared for the war, a very known phrase. Finally, and just to don't want to take more of your time, um, saying that it's true that there are many challenges that we will see together in the, incoming, in the incoming times. The new concept of NATO will come to update the new vision. As we always said, if the Treaty of Washington is the constitution, we can say, of NATO, the strategic concept try to see the vision. It's like the, the handbook for the next 10 years, and we need to adapt this vision in also to transmit this vision to our citizens. NATO is the umbrella of one million of people, and we need to avoid like um, needless debates. And I am referring to the debate that sometimes came to the public sphere about that, the useless or not of NATO. I think it's not about NATO yes or NATO no. I think that um, there are people who still remain in the uh, old idea 
that if you want to be peace, you need to invest more in butter than in canyons. I mean that to have industries to invest in butter, we need to have peace and security. And I think that when ideology remains in the past, get like a, like, you know, like a bone in the past, like frozen in the times. We need to adapt and we need to be updated with the times. We need NATO and we need to protect our citizens. So in conclusion, four fronts and many challenges we are going to face. Again, thank you very much for, for your time, for your attention. I hope uh, I can raise your interest and we can continue debating about what is the future of NATO. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel and Mr. Joel. Uh, I'm afraid we are running out of time, uh, out, out, out of time, sorry. So well, there's no time for questions, so we can collect them and then pass them to the Colonel and, uh, sorry, <laughs> and, and Mr. Joel. And I call now uh, the Chairwoman, please, to come to the table, and uh, the General Sanz, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for being here at this moment of the day after such a hot and, and long day that has been for, for many of us. I will now um, just, we, we want to close this session, but before we want to uh, just say thank you again to, to all participants as well as uh, General Felix Sanzroldan. Uh, for those of you who are from abroad and probably never heard of his name, uh, I'm sure you will be interested in his work uh, since he is, um, well, he entered the, mili the, the General Military Academy back in 1962, receiving the rank of Lieutenant of Artillery in 1966. Uh, he, since then, he has held various positions, including Deputy Director General of Plans and International Relations of the Ministry of Defense, Director General of Defense Policy, Chief of Defense Staff, and General of, of the Army, among others. And we, will, we could be continuing um, speaking about him for a long time. Um, he was director of the Spanish National Intelligence Center uh, from 2009 to 2019, so a very, very long 10 years. Um, and General Sanz holds a, an honorary doctorate from Alfonso de Simolzavi University in Madrid and has received numerous national and international decorations. Um, moreover, he is currently the president of the Social Council of the University of Castilla-La Mancha, and is also a member of the Executive Committee of the Conference of Social Councils of Spain, of Spanish Universities, and member of the International Advisory Panel of the Iberdrola Company. So, without further ado, please, uh, General Sanz, um, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, yep. Yep. Thank you very much, good afternoon, and thank you for being here in this uh, very special evening when somebody forgot to turn off the heat and uh, to see what is going on. Well, I'm very pleased uh, to be here for more than one reason. The first one is because uh, in NATO, like in any other organization, it's necessary to continuously renovate the people that is working in it. And I was one of the subjects of renovation. I was a member of the NATO Military Committee for four years. And one day somebody knocked at my door and said, you have to leave. Somebody new has to come to take your seat. And afterwards, I was for 10 years the member of the NATO, uh, the, the NATO Committee on Intelligence. And somebody knocked at my door also and say, go, please, home because somebody else has to come. And in order to be fruitful in all these changes in NATO, it's absolutely necessary to have people like you that from the very beginning are interested in one very difficult, very difficult, I repeat, organization. Very difficult to understand not only the parameters about what we're working with, but also the things in continuous movement that are changing, like a, a few minutes ago we, we, we were aware of, with, by the hand of the two, two persons that be here before me, continuously 
the world is moving, and that forced NATO to move again. Uh, I entered for the first time in NATO at the age of 36. Uh, at that time, I entered in NATO through a back door. I was not allowed to enter, like any other officer, to the main gate with a badge and, and the, w waiting for a salute from the military policeman. No, I have to enter, like I say, we're civilian from the back door. And it was 36. I was, of course, very poorly prepared for the mission that I had about to perform in NATO, that was to create the, 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 the documents uh, that establish the way to Spain to join NATO. And uh, this is something that, because somebody is interested from the very beginning of their public lives, this is something that will never happen again. And the people from Spain and from the countries here representing that enter in NATO will not enter through the back door. They will enter through the main gate. And the day they sit down in one particular position in NATO, they will be aware of what NATO is about and what to do in order to be efficient in such a difficult organization. So that's why I say that this, uh, this uh, uh, initiative for me is very important and is of course, of a very high value. Who knows, maybe here is seated now the pen rep of one particular country, or is it down here the mill rep of one particular country, even can be a woman, because it's not normal until today, due to the fact that the, on the armies and navies, the most of 99 in some of them 100% were men, but who knows, maybe one of you very soon will be, and I say very soon because it's one, one or two uh, years from now, it's because life goes very fast. So very soon one of you can be the military representative of one particular country in NATO. And it's good if you start, as I said, your public life from the beginning, because NATO is an organization very difficult to, to understand, and it's very difficult also to take the pace, go along the pace of progress within NATO. Uh, well, this is uh, something that I want to use a little bit this, for finishing this seminar. I know that it's not actually finishing because you have many other activities tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. Uh, I think that we were not expecting to have today the kind of legend that we are having. Imagine, 2017, President Trump in the ceremony of inauguration of the new NATO headquarters. He says something like, NATO is dead. NATO is obsolete. NATO serves for nothing. Uh, if you don't pay more for NATO, I will retreat from NATO, I will go back to the United States and you do whatever you want with that organization, 70. In 21, Macron said, NATO is dead. He said something more. I don't know exactly the word, but he said, NATO is clinically or something like that, dead. It's not the first time. In 1953, the International Herald Tribune said, NATO is dead. 53, 17, 21. Is NATO dead? It's better than never. NATO today is better than never. And for many people that never take time to study what NATO was about or what NATO served for, etc., today is taking part of its time to know what is the mission of NATO, NATO? And many people, including the cab driver that took me from one side to the other, when this Russian is attacking, say, oh, thank God we have NATO. A cab driver. So what I'm trying to tell you is that probably we're enjoying now, respect to NATO, one position that we have to go many years back to enjoy the same. And that is absolutely true. 
Well, uh, el, uh, it's interesting to know also that uh, the organizations related to our security take the real value when we feel that we are not secure. And uh, so what is going on today related to NATO is something that we can consider neutral, normal. The question is how long will be able to keep NATO in the front of our security? That will be a matter of the, the war in Ukraine. When the war ended, NATO will go again to say it's an absolute uh, uh, organization or is it clinically dead or, or we will keep, be able to keep NATO alive for more time. And this will be your responsibility. Your responsibility. I'm, I'm too, telling you absolutely, seriously. In 10 years time, many of you will be working in international affairs in one way or the other. Some of you will be working in NATO. And Whatever is your job, either in international affairs or related to NATO or related only to security or public affairs, you have to manage to tell to the rest of the world that NATO is important because NATO will be important in 10 years now as it was 10 years ago. Well, uh, and, and how to do that? Well, we have something in absolutely interesting now in Madrid in 15 years' time. And, uh, and is, uh, um, in 15 days, excuse me, time, which is the, uh, the, the NATO summit. Uh, in the NATO summit, uh, we are going to, to have NATO, let's put it in this way, like naked. NATO will come to Madrid. You know, it's something that we have to keep in mind. NATO is always NATO. So the, the NATO military committee is the same committee working in Madrid or working in Brussels or wherever. So it's kind of a, let's, let's pick up the people of the organization and put that people to work in Madrid. Basically it's this. But this is the uppermost important because if the decision are right, 10 years from now, instead to say the, 2000, the 2022 NATO Strategic Concept, they will say, the Madrid Strategic Concept. So if, if we do something right, 10 years from now, people will continue talking about Madrid related to the way to solve our problems of security and defense. Uh, so keeping that in mind, if I have the possibility, and you have to consider, just for this part of the seminar, important enough to have the capability to talk to Mr. Biden or Mr. Sanchez or Mr. whoever about the NATO. He said, you are sitting here, chief of the state of the government, and listen to me. I want, because I am a member of the civil society, I am a student, I am starting my public life, let me give you some advice, and I hope you will take that advice into consideration. And the first uh, one, sorry, probably will be, let's be pragmatic. NATO can not do everything. If you take a look, let's take, let's, let's take that exercise. It will take you a couple of minutes. Go to the Brussels summit on 2021. In the Brussels summit of, of 2021, NATO has to do everything. Everything looks like if it was a character of a novel looking for a writer. I have to do something. Security, uh, cyber security, of course. Climate change, of course. Gender uh, consideration, I don't know if this is correct to translate. Of course we will do that. Terrorism, naturally I will do terrorism, wherever. But simultaneously you have to think, and are the NATO members ready to give that responsibility to NATO? When somebody put a bomb in the trains in Madrid and killed 200 persons from Madrid, and we start a very long and difficult fight against the uh, uh, jihadism, 
was any time in that long war that the government of Spain thought, thought in NATO to solve that problem? What I want to tell you, but at the same time, arrives, not at the same time, but a few years later, arrives the war in Ukraine. And everyone asks NATO, please take care of that. So that is what I mean when I say that we have to be pragmatic. So that is the first thing that we have to tell to every uh, chief of staff of government that will be seated in the, in the Palacio de Congresos in Madrid. Please be pragmatic. Do whatever you have to do. Don't miss your effort doing a lot of things in a different places. Because it's not only that probably is not your mission, it's also that many countries, if not all, are not ready to give to you that responsibility. We have mentioned many times cybersecurity. Is any country of NATO ready to give, to give that responsibility to NATO? If somebody happened tomorrow, let's imagine that tomorrow the, the, all the TGB trains, uh, como se diga, uh, are stopped at one o'clock. For one o'clock to one uh, to 13 hours and two minutes. At two minutes after 13 hours, all start to work completely well. Nothing has happened. Two minutes is nothing. You will arrive two minutes, probably you arrive on time because two minutes is quite simple to recover. And, but if somebody can say, all the trains up a stop in Spain because I did it. And do you imagine in that situation that uh, the chief of defense of Spain knock at the door of NATO and say, please, help me. What I'm trying to tell you, I mean, we can think different of what I am telling you. But what I'm trying to tell you is that NATO is more useful for the things that were create, was created. And we have seen that and today, when a cab driver told to us, please, NATO, help me, because the Russians are trying to disturb my life. Uh, if I was, uh, at the same time, uh, have this possibility to talk to the, to the all the chief of state of the government, we also will uh, will ask to them, are you ready to continue with the open doors policy? That was to discuss in Madrid. Are you ready for that? Or we better have the opportunity to administer what has been a victory. Of course, it has been a victory. When Spain entered in NATO, we were the country number 16. If everything goes right in Madrid, will be 32, just double. Just double. NATO has been doubled in a few years. So we, we think that it's interesting to continue our open door policy, or we have to discuss that a little. Because we are sending at least two messages. One is to Russia, that has been explained perfectly by my friend, uh, the colonel, but we are sending some messages to the possible candidates that if we do not accomplish later, they will be in a very big frustration. In the NATO summit of 2008, 2008 in Bucharest, the president of the United States was George Bush the, the second. The president of Spain was uh, uh, Rodríguez Zapatero. In that discussion, Bush asked to anyone but the heads of delegation to leave the room. And he said to the heads of delegation, if we are not ready to give to Ukraine today the capability to be NATO country, it's better to forget it. But we cannot keep Ukraine in the continuous thinking that sooner than we'll be a member of NATO. Because you all know that that will not be soon. So let's, let's, be, let's be clear with the new candidate. So that is why I'm telling that in any uh, elements of the open door policy, we're talking about two, at least two, two directions. And we have to keep that two in mind. It's interesting also if we 
have to, the opportunity to to uh, to talk to the to the head of delegation of this NATO summit, if we are ready to clearly say that the NATO missions are the mission for what NATO was created. That is in the front. It was defense, collective defense, it was crisis, uh, uh, crisis management, it was uh, collective security. We have to tell that as clear as possible and not in a group of possible missions that uh, maybe has to be put to perform by NATO in the future, but that had less sense than this today, that we have. And, and we have to also to have the possibility to talk to the, to the chief of the staff of the government that what is our mission? I remember my first visit to the United States Strategic Command, and at the door, there is a big sign, and say, my, my mission is peace. It's too vague, I think. <laughs> I mean, can be a better, uh, but we have to, to write in the front piece of NATO that my mission is collective defense. And a lot of things. And I mentioned also, and because it has been treated for both of the persons that had uh, occupied this, this table before me, Russia and China. I, I mean, I, I, I should subscribe absolutely what has been said for both of you, and I refer him to you and you. Uh, but I, I will advise to the head of the state of the government, but be careful with the rhetoric. I mean, when we, in a ceremony, and I, I should say ceremony with some kind of interest of crisis management, with our rhetoric goes upwards, then it's very difficult to solve it. Because no one of the parties that are taking care of the, of the, or, or the to solve a crisis want to go, to go back to their audiences saying, well, I say that, but now I, will, I have a different conception of what I said. It's not, it's not, I repeat, clever to start with the rhetorics that we're having today, especially with China. We can't say whatever about Russia because he is in, in uh, we all have seen television, they are killing uh, women that have given birth to their children, they are killing all our own people, they are absolutely destroying one country that is one and a half times Spain. So put all the rhetoric that you want to in Russia, and, but be careful. You should not put this kind of rhetoric with China. And it's something that is doing basically the United States. They have a, a specific world, like, let's put it in this way, between China and the United States. But in NATO, we are talking, and this is something probably the, less, the, the last time that I said to these people seated around in a table, I would say, please consider the common security elements. The key word is common. We have in NATO, because we are ready to defend the common security interest. If one particular member of the alliance has an interest that is not common, well, he's my friend, I can help in one way or the other, but if it's not common, don't put me to the rest of the European countries within the rhetoric that can be a little bit dangerous if we have to solve the, the, uh, the crisis in, and probably we have to in the very short time. Another thing, and this is because I am an army officer and I think that I, we are keep expecting in the last two strategic concepts of NATO what in the traditional strategic concepts of NATO said direction for the planning of NATO forces. That is what is waiting all the NATO soldiers, especially the, the leaders of the military establishment direction for the uh, creation or the establishment of NATO forces. We need that badly. 
because we are soldiers, we are not entering into any type of politics, so we have to look to our political leaders and say, hey, what kind of military instrument do you want to have? And I will take that responsibility, and with the money that my government gives to me, and with that direction, I make a tool that serves to what you are planning to do with the military forces. In the last two NATO strategic concepts, they are not clearly established that. So, maybe it's interesting to tell to the people seated around the table, don't forget to do that, because the most important instrument that NATO has is the military forces. And you have to take care of that and say what type or what kind of military forces do you want to have to accomplish with that mission. And um, probably the, 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 the element that we have to keep in mind more than the rest is that uh, after the day after the the Madrid summit, probably will be a good time, a good day to establish all the conversation, all the seminars, all the cañas that you want to with your friends, telling about if this is correct or if it's not correct, if they forgot something and they were too heavy in the explanation of a problem or it was too light. Uh, but it's something that this day we have to start doing. And this is again my way to connect with the beginning of this small intervention. After the day, the day after, we have people that will be interested in NATO summit because they had been always interested. And they will read, and the, the analyst of the Spanish Institute of Strategic Studies will read the NATO summit, and, and probably they make a very good uh, article for, for the opinion. Well, but this is not important. The important is for the rest of the citizens. What can do the summit and their communique to interest to the people that is not interested? And people that have to follow for another 10 years, or who knows, supporting NATO without knowing precisely what is what NATO is doing. So, and, it, and you can do a lot for that because any one of you can be a focal point for many others to discuss what NATO achieved in Madrid and what NATO should achieve in Madrid has not achieved. It. This is your responsibility. And that is what I want to, to, to take into, into your consideration because uh, it's something that is absolutely, absolutely necessary to continue for another 75 years, being a good uh, uh, defense organization. That is what mainly is, and that should be in this way for the years to come. Because the reason why the New York Times was wrong, Trump was wrong, and Macron was wrong, is because now we discover that we need NATO to be defended. That is the war. And that is what you have to spread. And that is what you have to keep in mind when 20 years from now you will have an important job in the office of the Secretary General of NATO. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, General Santroldan. Um, it's been an honor to host you here today um, and that you actually took the time to come here and speak to this group of, of young people who actually um, look, up, look up at people like you as, as life examples, right? Um, it has been very, very inspiring and, and I am personally very, very thankful for your, for your presence here. Um, just before uh, we finish, I would like to Thank you all again. I know I've said thank you like a hundred times today, but I would like to say thank you to each and every one of you a hundred times more. Um, we really appreciate your participation. As I, as I said um, before, uh, it's been a long and very hot day. So we really appreciate that you took the time to come here. 
And for those of you who are connected online, thanks uh, for, for actually uh, following these debates and these sessions uh, from home. Um, I, am, I would like to, to take one minute to thank all the organization team. I'm very proud of, of, of the team that we've made up and, and all the achievements that we are um, like actually achieving these days. Uh, it's been a, a, a tiresome period of, of time, but I, I can see that these projects coming together and being able to gather such an, a good amount of, of young professionals, it's, it's very impressive. Um, also, thank you all, all, all the participants, but also the speakers for coming here. Um, and yeah, uh, hopefully you will have found uh, this uh, conference is very informative. And for those of you who are participating in our four-day event, four-day event, uh, I hope you, you found them very, very helpful for your discussions in the workshops that we are having in the mornings and in the afternoons. Um, we would like to host you all very soon in, in future conferences, uh, and please just feel free to follow our, our activities on social media because we basically uh, publish everything we do there. Uh, so if you want to keep attending our conferences, our events, or even uh, join us as part of Yates Spain, we would be so happy to, to actually welcome you in, in our team. Um, I just want to... to uh, yeah, final remarks for those of you who are staying at the hotel and those of you who are from Madrid who are also participating in the event. Uh, tomorrow we have a very nice visit uh, to the military base in Torrejón de Ardoz, which is um, a place not, not far away from, from downtown. We're going to visit a la 12, so it's going to be a very, very nice uh, morning, hopefully not too hot. Uh, I, I cannot promise that, I'm very sorry. Um, we will bring some water for you guys so, so you don't die there. That would be very nice. Um, but yeah, please, uh, tomorrow we will meet at the hotel. We will give you indications right after the conference on where and when to meet because we will be going from, from the hotel with a bus all together to the military base. Um, so yeah, that was basically it. So thanks a lot, everyone, for coming here, and and thanks again for for the people to like the who have been following these sessions online. I will also thank all the team, all the speakers, and also the the tech, the very highly skilled people uh, who have been solving our our technical stuff. So thanks a lot, everyone, and hopefully you enjoyed uh, these sessions. Right now, we will leave you to go out and and enjoy downtown Madrid and have a nice dinner. So thanks a lot, everyone.